Okay, so uh, let's start. Uh, our uh, next speaker is uh, Julia Cavagnari uh, from Politecnico di Milano. And uh, her uh, title is uh, the, the Totally Disruptive Evolutions of Probability Measures. Please. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the organizers for the kind invitation. So in this talk, I will uh, uh, speak about our work in collaboration with uh, Giuseppe Savare from Bocconi University and Giacomo Sudini, postdoc at uh, Vienna University. So let's see uh, what is our aim. Our aim is to study this, what are called dissipative evolutions in the space of probability measures. So our state will be a probability measure and we will see uh, what, uh, what we mean by the dynamic. So uh, our interest is to study well poisonous results, so to give conditioning in order to have existence and uniqueness for this kind of uh, equations. So no control uh, is involved uh, up to now. So why we are interested in studying dissipative evolution in the space of priority measures? Uh, okay, we are uh, in this workshop, so we all know that uh, a measure is a nice tool to model uh, uh, a system of uh, involving a huge number of particles or uh, agents giving, for instance, the statistical distribution of them. Uh, so what is uh, uh, the example, uh, the main example that we should have in mind uh, when we speak about dissipative evolutions? The most, uh, the typical one is uh, uh, the case in which the dynamics is driven by the subdifferential of some convex functional, some potential energy or some interaction energy uh, that we want to minimize. And the dynamics follows uh, the opposite of the subdifferential. In this case, uh, if phi is a, a convex function, uh, then uh, at least uh, in, the, in the classical theory, the opposite of the subdifferential is a, a dissipative operator. And, uh, um, and we have a, a well-known uh, theory uh, to, to have well poisonous results for uh, dissipative evolutions. So in general, uh, I will present uh, in a moment uh, the general, uh, the classical case in which we are, uh, instead of... Uh, uh, being uh, in the framework of the vast time space, we are in the classical framework of an Hilbert space. And uh, I will recall the condition in order to have existence and uniqueness of solution for a dissipative equation in an Hilbert space. Whose particular example is the case in which the operator, uh, the dissipative operator B, is the opposite of the subdifferential or the gradient of a convex function. So the outline of the talk is the following. First, I will recall the classical theory of dissipative evolution in Hilbert spaces that will uh, serve as, uh, as a, um, let's say, an example in order to develop the theory in the case of the probability measure space. Uh, and then we will discuss uh, the notion of dissipativity in this metric framework of the, the vast time space with two approach, one intrinsic and another one that is called the lifting approach. So let's start. Uh, so a review on uh, uh, the classical theory. So assume that we are in uh, an Hilbert space, calligraphic uh, H, and we have given an operator B from H to H, possibly B may be multivalued, so uh, set valued. Uh, and the important thing is that uh, since H is an Hilbert space, the nature of B is exactly to send an element X belonging to H, the state space, to an element V belonging to the same space. Uh, so um, we, for simplicity, we may think that B to be single valid, and so this inclusion will be an equation. So our interest is to, uh, to give condition on the operator B in order to have uh, well poisonous for this Cauchy problem. So it is known that uh, uh, if we want stability condition, stability contraction property for the solution, this is equivalent to ask a dissipativity condition on the operator B. Uh, dissipativity uh, is strictly linked with the structure of the Hilbertian space on, on which B lives. So it involves the scalar product between V minus W where in the case of single valued B, V is B of X, W is B of Y, scalar product with X minus Y. These scalar products we ask to be less or equal than zero in order to have the stability contraction property. More generally, if we want to relax the property with some uh, uh, coefficient lambda, lambda real actually, so maybe also negative, 
then uh, we uh, we speak about lambda dissipativity of the operator B. And T is in case of positive lambda, T is uh, a so-called one-sided Lipschitz continuity assumption on the operator B. So this condition, together with maximality, allows us to have well poisonous results in the classical framework. What is maximality of the operator B? We say that B is maximal dissipative if uh, in the sense of inclusion by graph. So if, it's, if it B is dissipative and its graph is not included in uh, the graph of another dissipative operator. So it's maximal in the sense of inclusion. A particular example of a maximal uh, uh, dissipative B is the case of continuous dissipative operators. So we may think of B to be continuous and dissipative. So uh, it's important for us to, uh, to do the following observation. So to make a relation between the property of dissipativity that we ask on the operator B, that it involves the structure of the scalar product of the Hilbert space, and a metric notion. So let's see how we can actually look at the scalar product by a metric viewpoint. This will be fundamental if we want to implement this theory in the space, in the metric space of the vast system, in the metric of vast system space. So uh, if uh, we consider X a point uh, in H, and we consider the first uh, expansion of X, first order expansion of X in the direction given by V, B of X, with tau units, and we do the same starting from Y in the direction given by B of Y or W with tau unit. And if now we consider the square distance between this first order expansion that we call uh, d tau, then uh, it's, uh, in, it's, you can see that uh, the scalar product involved in the definition of dissipativity is nothing but the derivative at zero of this square distance. So when we ask dissipativity, so we ask this scalar product to be less or equal than zero, we are asking this square, the de derivative of this square distance to be negative. So we are asking uh, the decreasing of the square distance. This means, uh, this implies that uh, dissipativity of the operator B implies a contraction of the operator associated with the explicit Euler scheme. And uh, uh, another important thing, uh, uh, to observe is that since uh, in the classical uh, Hilbertian case, the square distance uh, here with respect to tau is convex, then uh, we can also go back in time, let's say, and uh, say that uh, the resolvent operator is also a contraction. And so also the implicit Euler scheme will uh, converge. This is, uh, uh, it's important to notice that this is, comes from uh, dissipativity of B and from convexity of uh, this square distance. Uh, okay, and the maximality uh, allows uh, the, the, the resolved operator associated with the implicit scheme to be defined uh, everywhere. So we can actually solve uh, the implicit scheme. So now we can, uh, uh, this is the classical uh, implicit, implicit scheme. I just wrote the implicit one, but we can also deal with the explicit one. So if we assume it, uh, mm, very uh, well-known results by Cranley Liget tells us that uh, then if our operator is maximal dissipative, then uh, the uh, discrete uh, uh, solution obtained by the, the implicit scheme converge and converge uniformly to a, a curve that is Lipschitz continuous uh, and satisfies a nice uh, error estimate uh, with respect to the, the, the scheme uh, in this way. So um, in the classical uh, theory of Hilbertian framework, we have a convergence of the implicit scheme by asking maximality, uh, maximal dissipativity of the operator B. We'll have uh, a similar result if uh, we, drop, uh, we drop the assumption of maximality for B and we ask uh, B to, be, um, to satisfy some uh, uh, growth condition, some boundedness condition, and this will ensure us uh, to uh, have convergence also of the explicit scheme. We, we can work either one with or uh, with the other. Okay. And uh, mm, okay, this I will, uh, I will not enter into the details of this. It's also possible to, um, to look at the ordinary differential equation or inclusion by a variational viewpoint and characterize the unique solution of the ordinary differential inclusion by an evolution variation inequality that is not uh, involving the derivative of uh, your solution, your trajectory, but just the derivative of a metric of a distance. But, uh, okay, I will skip it. 
So now we want to transfer all this machinery to the case of the vast stand space. So let, uh, it was well introduced uh, in all the talks and uh, now in uh, the previous talk by Hélène. Let me just recall uh, the notation. So now uh, we take uh, the space uh, P2 over uh, H. H uh, can be even RD. It's, not, uh, it's still uh, well, uh, uh, an important case, let's say. But anyway, we, we denote by this uh, the space of probability measures with finite second moment uh, over uh, the space uh, uh, straight H, that is uh, Hilbert or a uh, simple case RD. Uh, then uh, an important operation that uh, will be used uh, for measures uh, is the push forward per op operator that allow us, for instance, to transfer a mass from one uh, space to another by mean of a map or uh, uh, along the same space to shift, for instance, our mass, uh, depending on uh, uh, how the map X is defined. For instance, if X is a map defined from some uh, Borel space omega with uh, endo with some probability measure P, and it goes, it has values in uh, the space H where our probability lives, then uh, X sharp P is uh, nothing but the law of this uh, random variable X. That is a measure on the space uh, straight H. If X belongs to L2 with respect to omega of, uh, with respect to this probability measure P, then that is a, uh, uh, its law will belong to P2 of H. Okay. Uh, then uh, we are on this space P2, we have uh, the vast stand distance. Uh, that is a, a concept of distance that works as follows. So given two measures, mu and nu, we look at all the possible couplings, also called uh, plans, uh, connecting the measure mu and the measure nu in such a way that the first marginal is mu, the second marginal is nu. And uh, these plans, uh, uh, this coupling, uh, uh, gives uh, a pairing between the particles in the support of mu and particles in the support of mu, and computes the square distance uh, between uh, these uh, pairings, let's say. And uh, uh, we look for the minimum among all the possible ways to couple uh, the, two, the two measures. We can write... Uh, uh, the vast stand distance also in terms, uh, uh, in a more probabilistic taste, uh, in terms of random variables. So uh, we can say also that the vast stand distance between mu and nu is the minimum among all the possible uh, ways to represent the measure mu and the measure nu by uh, random variables uh, and computing uh, the, uh, the L2 distance, uh, square distance between, uh, the L2 distance between uh, these two uh, uh, parameterization X and Y. We call with gamma O the set of optimal couplings. Just to give uh, an idea uh, of what, what is a coupling, for simplicity, consider mu to be a measure, an empirical measure concentrated on uh, three points with uh, maybe equal uh, mass, and the new another measure concentrated on three points. Then a coupling is nothing but uh, a way to pair points in the support of mu with points in the support of, uh, of nu without uh, any particular constant. We can uh, pair x3 with both y1 and y3, for instance. In this way, we are splitting the mass uh, at x3 into y1 and y3. Or uh, we can uh, associate to one point only one. And among all the possibilities, we are looking for the one minimizing uh, the uh, sum of the distances. That is how uh, the vast stand distance uh, will become uh, in this uh, uh, simplest framework. OK, so uh, now we want to, um, as I said, to extend the machinery uh, of dissipative evolutions in the Hilbert, uh, for Hilbert spaces in this context, context of the vast extent space. So let me recall briefly. Uh, the nature of uh, the operator B in the classical framework was uh, an operator from the space H where the state lives to the same space H, having the role of velocity. Uh, if we are dealing with evolution of measures uh, that uh, whose mass is preserved in time, so it's a probability measure for any time, then uh, the, the equation that we have in mind is the continuity equation. Uh, the continuity equation uh, is a way to describe the evolution of uh, uh, the mass uh, mu where uh, the, the wall mass is driven by a field that is a mean field, actually, 
that uh, we can think of F as the field driving, uh, let's say, each single particle in the support uh, of mu. And F has not the same, uh, um, the same structure of B, because uh, given uh, a measure, uh, actually also a point, gives you a vector. It doesn't give you another measure on the velocity. So now our aim is to extend the structure uh, for classical OD in the Albertian case to the space of measures. So now we want to give a meaning to this equation in which the state is a measure that is evolving, but also the field, the vector field, is a probability vector field. So is a field that, given a measure, gives you another measure with the role of velocity. And we want to give a meaning to this. So let me uh, explain better. So our aim is to, uh, to study generation of uh, contraction semigroups for uh, driven by uh, what we call the dissipative probability vector fields that are operators uh, denoted by bold F that taken a measure, uh, the state uh, that is a measure at time t, we denote by uh, PEDEX t the evaluation of the measure at time t, taken a measure give you a measure where on the tangent bundle of H, in, where the tangent bundle of H is nothing but this, the product, the Cartesian product between H and itself, in which the first copy of H plays the role of state, the second copy of H plays the role of velocity. Uh, I, in the following, I will denote by straight X, the projection, if I give you a pair in uh, uh, H times H, I denote with X, the projection on the first component, so on the state space, and with V, the projection on the second component, so on the velocity. So let's let's understand better uh, what, what is this uh, probability vector field. Uh, the role of the probability vector field is to give to any point X in the support of mu, instead of uh, a vector uh, direction, it gives you a distribution of velocities. So a measure on the velocity. A particular case of uh, probability vector field is, of course, the case in which uh, F is uh, a Dirac delta concentrated on uh, some vector field F. This is a particular case. Okay, and uh, uh, if we think about the inclusion, then it means that uh, we are not prescribing just one distribution of velocities, but uh, a set of possible distribution of velocities. So a set of probability measures on the velocity. Okay, uh, let's explain graphically uh, how F, uh, um, the entity of, of this probability vector field. So F uh, at mu is a measure on the, uh, the, the, um, the tangent space of H, so on the product H times H, in which the first projection of uh, this uh, vector field computed at mu is uh, me the measure mu itself. So it, uh, it takes the information of the state where it is computed in the first projection. Then if we consider a point X in the support of mu and we consider the section uh, on it, so we disintegrate F with respect to the, the first projection, what we get is the distribution of velocities available at X. That is a measure that we call F with pad at X at mu is a measure just on the second copy of, of H having the role of velocities. So it's a measure on the velocity. And we can reconstruct uh, uh, by this integration, we can reconstruct F by, this, uh, by varying uh, X in the support of mu and uh, reconstructing the whole measure. Okay, so as I said, a particular case of a priority vector field is the case in which uh, uh, the priority vector field is uh, what we call deterministic in the sense that it is concentrated on the graph of a function, a function uh, uh, small f. So for any point uh, in the support of mu, it is a Dirac delta uh, concentrated on f at x uh, mu. f uh, may be non-local. Okay. This is a particular case. And in this particular case, uh, while uh, we have to give uh, a meaning uh, to the measure differential inclusion, uh, a concept actually introduced by, by Benedetto Piccoli, for the deterministic case, uh, the meaning of this inclusion uh, is uh, reduced to the continuity equation driven by f. Okay, so now um, some questions to be addressed. 
Um, so now we, we have introduced uh, uh, what is our aim, but uh, uh, we want to, um, if we want to, to extend the theory of uh, dissip dissipative evolutions uh, in this framework, uh, we have some problem because uh, in the Hilbertian case, we have the structure of the, we have a, a, a vector space first, uh, that uh, the case of uh, polarity measures is not a vector space. And we have a scalar product in the Hilbertian case for which we, we are able to define the concept of dissipativity for B. While in this case of the metric space, we don't have a scalar product. So the first thing to address is how to define the notion of dissipativity in this case. Um, then once we are able to define a concept of dissipativity, does this uh, uh, give us the convergence, uh, the desired convergence of the explicit scheme or uh, of the unimplicit scheme, uh, can we characterize the limit of this scheme in some variational way as uh, uh, we, can, we, we were able to do in the uh, Hilbertian case? So these are the questions that we want to address now. Before addressing them, let me uh, give some example that will introduce uh, the theory. So um, let's think about the simplest case in which uh, the uh, probability vector field is deterministic, so it's concentrated on a map F. Then a uh, typical uh, example that uh, we want to address is the case in which F is a, a combination of uh, some potential energy and some uh, uh, interaction energy. If uh, we want uh, to have uh, uh, well posedness results for, uh, for instance, for the continuity equation, then uh, there are uh, results by Piccoli e Rossi for the continuity equation, recently by Bonnet Francosca for the continuity inclusion, um, asking uh, uh, assumption on uh, the, the vector field F, enforcing uh, uh, existence and uniqueness of solution of the continuity equation. What are these assumptions? Basically, Lipschitz continuity with respect to both X and the measure. Uh, now, um, but what, what we will do is uh, uh, to use uh, another idea, let's say, coming from Piccoli uh, working on these measure differential equations. Uh, in the work of Piccoli of 2019, he was able to prove uh, existence in a certain sense that is uh, uh, as some relation with what I will say, but uh, it's not ours. But while uh, there was some uh, uh, problems for getting uh, uniqueness, uh, we will discuss uh, uh, our approach. So what is uh, the other possibility? The other possibility is uh, instead of asking uh, F to be Lipschitz as a map, we ask the measure concentrated on F to be Lipschitz. Meaning that we are asking that there exists an optimal coupling connecting mu and nu, along which our vector field F is Lipschitz. Uh, this means that if F is Lipschitz in the classical sense, then of course it will satisfy this relation with respect to actually any plan. But in general, this is weaker. Can this, uh, uh, is this sufficient to have uh, existence and uniqueness? Uh, we will see. We will see that this definition, this uh, concept of dissipative of uh, Ipsis continuity is uh, strictly related to uh, with the concept uh, uh, that we give of dissipativity of uh, our probability vector field. So how to define dissipativity? Uh, as, as we um, stressed at the beginning, uh, even uh, in the Albertian setting, the scalar product can be involved in the definition of dissipativity, can be viewed uh, as uh, in a metric way. So as the derivative at zero, the right derivative at zero of the square distance between uh, the first expansion of X in the direction uh, given by V and the first expansion of Y in the direction given by W. Uh, this uh, is what we will use. So. In our space of the vast extent, uh, in our vast extent space of probability measures, we have the distance. So we can uh, use this structure in order to define a pseudo scalar product in our case. The problem is how can we describe the first order expansion here in the case of measures? So now the role of X will be played by mu, a measure mu. The role of y by another measure, nu. The role of v will be played by the action of our priority vector field in its second projection, and the same for w. How can we express 
the fact that we are steering mu in the direction given by v of tau units by the push forward operator uh, with respect to the right map. So now the role of uh, uh, T's expansion will be uh, played by T's. In the, let's think uh, for simplicity of the, on the deterministic case in which uh, the priority vector field F is concentrated on T small F. Then at this action, uh, the mu tau of first leg expansion is exactly expressed by this operation. We are exactly taking our measure mu and we are moving it in the direction given by F of tau unit. In the general case, uh, we have to consider that F may not be concentrated on a map, and so we have uh, to take this general expression. We can actually represent uh, uh, the priority vector field F evaluated at mu being a measure on the product space by probability theory. We can uh, express it as the law of uh, appearing XP. And uh, in this case, we can uh, represent mu of T in this nice way with respect to the, uh, to the random variables X and V. So now we have, uh, let's say, the machinery. Let's uh, uh, now define the our pseudo-scalar product, uh, as I said. So we define the pseudo-scalar product between uh, the probability vector field available at mu and the probability vector field available at nu by mean of the derivative, the right derivative at zero of the square vastness and distance between the first order expansions. This is just a definition, uh, but if we just use this as it is, uh, of course, it will not be so useful. So we were able to actually compute it and if we, uh, we compute it, we, we, uh, we can prove that this is equal to the following expression. So the minimum of uh, the uh, scalar product in L2 between uh, these objects that are the random variables uh, uh, expressing uh, f of mu, xv as low f of mu, yw as, as low f of mu. And uh, among uh, this minimum is uh, among all the possible way to uh, represent uh, f of mu and f of mu in such a way that uh, along the base uh, x, y, we are moving with an optimal plan. This comes uh, uh, by computation. Uh, if uh, we now want to simplify this expression and write it uh, in the particular case in which the vector field f, the priority vector field f is deterministic, then we, we end up with this expression. So the scalar prod, the pseudo scalar product of the two vector field is nothing but the minimum along optimal plans connecting mu and nu of what is a uh, classical scalar product integrated with respect to gamma. It's a minimum. While uh, if we compute the left derivative at zero, we obtain uh, the maximum of the same expression. So uh, it's important to notice that the left derivative of uh, the square vastness and distance between the first order expansion is greater than the right. Okay. So now uh, we have uh, uh, the definition of pseudo scalar product, and we can use it. Uh, as a definition of uh, uh, for dissipative to, to ask our vector field F uh, to be dissipative. So we say that our priority vector field F is metrically dissipative or dissipative if uh, our pseudo scalar product is less or equal than zero. Meaning, that, uh, if we look at uh, the previous definition, meaning that uh, there exists uh, an optimal coupling along which this, is less, this integral is less or equal than zero. Okay, let's see. Uh, first uh, results. Uh, with this notion of uh, metric dissipativity, together with uh, local boundedness we are uh, of the, um, the, the vector field F, we are able to uh, implement an explicit scheme and to have convergence uh, while poisonous results. We are also able to uh, get some characterization in terms of an evolution variation inequality of the limiting solution. But uh, the, in this talk, I'm uh, more uh, interested in the implicit scheme. For the implicit scheme, there are, uh, we have to face some problem. Because uh, uh, as I recall at the beginning, uh, the, the fact that the implicit scheme in the Albertian case uh, is solvable, so the, the resolvent operator associated to the implicit scheme is a contraction, is strictly connected to two things, the dissipativity of the operator and the convexity of the square distance of the first order expansion with respect to tau. However, the square vastest distance, uh, this map, is not convex. Indeed, 
we, we say that the, right, the left derivative at zero is greater than the right derivative at zero. So it, it actually is, it is semi-concave. So uh, we will not get the uh, automatically, at least, uh, the contraction of the resolvent. And so uh, there is some problem if we want to implement an implicit Euler scheme. So how can we overcome this problem? Uh, first mm, possibility is to observe that in some particular cases, uh, the concept of metric dissipativity is actually uh, equivalent to a notion that usually is stronger. That is the notion of total dissipativity. So in particular cases, for instance, in the case in which uh, the priority vector field F is deterministic, so concentrated on a map and continuous, then uh, the metric dissipativity is actually equivalent to a total dissipativity condition that in a moment I will, uh, I will explain. So from now on, we will not consider, uh, I mean, uh, we will not uh, put ourselves in this particular case, but we will put ourselves in the particular case of probability vector fields that are totally dissipative. For instance, uh, metric dissipative, deterministic and continuous field. So what is total dissipativity? So I recall uh, what was metric dissipativity. Metric dissipativity was uh, uh, the pseudo scalar product between uh, the, the priority vector field at mu and nu less or equal than zero. Since that pseudo scalar product was uh, involving a minimum among optimal uh, couplings, this means that for metric dissipativity, we are asking, we are asking the existence, let's see the, um, the easy case of uh, uh, deterministic field. We are asking the existence of an optimal plan along which we have dissipativity. For total dissipativity, we are asking something stronger. We are not asking the existence of an optimal plan along which we have dissipativity of uh, our field, but we are asking that along any plan, even not, or any coupling, even not optimal, we have uh, this dissipativity condition. Of course, uh, this is a stronger notion, but in that particular case of uh, determinist and continuous uh, vector fields, actually the two notions are equivalent by some uh, uh, approximation uh, results. Okay, so now we put our 70s case of total dissipativity. Why this will uh, uh, help us? You see that uh, total dissipativity can be written in terms of, uh, uh, with a probabilistic, uh, let's see, uh, way of writing. So if uh, total dissipativity occurs, if for any pair of measures mu and nu, and every, uh, pairings, uh, tetra maps, uh, in L2 representing f of mu and f of nu, we have this condition. So we are not, uh, we are not, we don't have a preference direction along which this condition should occur. This should hold for any realization of f of nu and f of nu. So, uh, what is now the idea? The idea is that a totally dissipative condition allow us to pass from the space of the Wasserstein, uh, from the Wasserstein space of priority measures in which uh, we are considering our uh, evolution into an Hilbert space, L2, of the realization of the representation of our measures in this way. So imagine to fix a reference probability space, omega, uh, polish, with uh, a non-atomic measure P, so that every measure mu in P2 can be represented by uh, as the law of some random variables uh, in L2 with respect to the measure P from omega to the space uh, H. Then uh, we are we lift uh, our uh, framework from the space from the Wasserstein space to the space L2 that is an Hilbert space uh, that with the scalar product. We will uh, lift a measure mu uh, by its uh, one of its possible uh, representation X whose law is mu. And then we have to lift also our priority vector field F, defining an operator B in the product L2 times L2, whose law is our priority vector field F. If we are able to prove that total dissipativity of F translates into dissipativity of this operator B, then we have done 
And also we have to prove that maximality here transfers into maximality here. Then we have done, we, are, uh, we, we can conclude because uh, if B is dissipative and maximal, then uh, since we are in a Hilbert space, we can use the classical machinery to implement the unimplicit scheme here at this level, and then come back uh, getting also existence and uniqueness of solution in this space. So now the question is, uh, does total dissipativity translates into dissipativity of the operator B? Does maximality of F translates into maximality of B so that we can work on this lifted space and then come back? So let's see first uh, how B is defined. Uh, so B is uh, defined on the space L2 that we call uh, calligraphic H as, the, as follows. So B is called Lagrangian parameterization of F if it is made by all the pairings X, XV whose law belongs to F. This implies that uh, the, the operator B is law invariant in the sense that if we know that XV belongs to B, meaning that the, its law belongs to F, and if we know that we have another pair uh, YW whose law is the same of XV, then also YW should belong to B. So B is law invariant. Uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, B, the Lagrangian parameterization, and our uh, probability, our Eulerian counterpart, F. And actually, we can prove that totally dissipativity assumption on F is the right one to have dissipativity of, the, of its Lagrangian counterpart, B. There is a, a, an equivalence, actually. If B is dissipative, then its, uh, its image is totally dissipative and vice versa. What, uh, uh, what we want now is to have uh, the same for maximality. We would like to say that uh, F, our probability vector field F is maximal totally dissipative if and only if the operator B, its Lagrangian representation, is maximal totally dissipative, is uh, maximally dissipative in the sense of L2. This is uh, more tricky because uh, uh, this requires us to prove that for, uh, um, for an operator B, dissipative, there exists a maximal extension. This result is known. I mean, if we have a dissipative operator B in an Hilbert space, then there exists a maximal dissipative extension. However, what we want is to preserve the low invariance of B. So if we have a low invariant dissipative operator B, we would like its maximal extension to be low invariant as well, in order to have this uh, correspondence with, with the image in the space of probabilities. This result is, uh, uh, was not available in the literature because uh, the classical extension result for, uh, uh, for dissipative operators or for Lipschitz maps goes back to the case brown valentine extension theorem that is just an existence result. It doesn't give you a constructive way to, um, to give an explicit uh, uh, formulation of what is the extension. So how can we prove the existence of a... a an extension of a, a dissipative operator B that preserves low invariance. We discovered uh, rec a recent work by Bauschke Wang that gives uh, a constructive proof of the, the Kirsten Valentine extension theorem using self dual, self -dual uh, maps. And by this result, we were able to prove that actually uh, we can uh, construct uh, uh, an extension preserving low invariance. So after this, uh, we were able to. Uh, to get the right uh, correspondence between maximal dissipative operator B in the Hilbertian framework and uh, its uh, uh, maximal total dissipative, totally dissipativity of uh, its image. So now we can, this means that now we can work in the lifted space, construct the implicit scheme there, and uh, uh, go back to the space of probabilities. So this is, uh, uh, how much time? To... Okay, thank you. So uh, this means uh, uh, that, so this is the, um, let's say the main results that we can obtain. So if we assume that F is maximal totally dissipative by this uh, trick to go to the lift space and come back, we can prove that uh, the implicit Euler scheme that we can write also in the, in the space of measures is solvable. It converges uniformly to some limiting curve that is Lipschitz continuous. Uh, and uh, we have also a nice error estimate compared to the classical one. Moreover, uh, 
since we know it was also recalled uh, by Hélène before, that uh, uh, Lipschitz curves, or more generally absolutely continuous curves uh, in the vast extent space, uh, can be viewed as solution of some continuity equation. Then uh, this curve that we obtain uh, by this uh, scheme is actually the unique solution of a continuity equation driven by uh, the element of minimal norm of our operator. We can prove that uh, uh, if f is maximal totally dissipative, then there exists a unique minimal section, element of minimal uh, norm with respect to the Wasserstein uh, definition, let's say. And this element of minimal norm is actually concentrated on a map. And so we can put this map here in the continuity equation. Moreover, we can also characterize this curve in a variational way, um, similarly as what we can do in the Albertian case. Uh, moreover, since we, we did all these by passing through the, through the L2 space of parameterizations, we, are all, we have also a Lagrangian characterization of our solution. Uh, so not only uh, this is the unique solution of uh, the uh, continuity equation driven by the element of minimal norm, but uh, it is also characterized as the process, as the, the law of the process, that is the unique solution of the system in the space L2 driven by the Lagrangian representation B of F. And then we have uh, other properties. Um, okay, so there are, uh, okay. I will I will skip this, but just to let you know that uh, uh, okay, as I said at the beginning, um, a particular example of a dissipative operator is uh, the case of uh, in which the operator is the opposite of the sub, sub differential of a convex function. Uh, the fact that uh, the opposite of the sub differential of a convex function is dissipative is true in the Hilbertian case. In the vast space, uh, it, it's not really true that uh, the, the opposite of the subdifferential of a convex uh, uh, function or a totally convex function is totally, uh, totally dissipative. But uh, we can play with the element of minimal norm that satisfies the right condition to get, uh, uh, to get the result uh, uh, also in this case. Okay, so I conclude with just mentioning some future per uh, perspective, perspectives of this work. So um, so we have seen that uh, the way in which uh, we were able to uh, implement the implicit scheme uh, um, relies, I mean, ask us to, uh, um, to require that strong condition of total dissipativity of our operator in order to, uh, to make the lift uh, procedure. So our, uh, uh, our interest now is to see if it is possible to keep just the notion of metric dissipativity that is more intrinsic to, and try to, to implement an implicit scheme uh, even with this uh, weaker assumption. Then another uh, open question is uh, um, study the asymptotic behavior of the solution that we are uh, uh, obtaining and uh, time-dependent priority vector fields. So these are some uh, uh, bibliography and uh, thank you for the attention. Thank you. Uh, and oh, sorry. Uh, another other question or comment for Julia? So I was wondering if you know something about the structure of the B. So you have kind of your um, derivatives are, are elements of this this B. So for example, if you knew that B is convex or something, then you could also have one so i'm thinking about optimization so yeah uh, if i want to um, optimize here then maybe i have some freedom because i have several elements to choose and if i would have convexity then maybe i could even choose convex combinations or something like that so okay uh, actually um if you ask uh, um f to be f or b to be maximal then you have uh, the the convex combination of elements there even by by plants will be there as well. Oh, okay, very interesting, thanks. Yeah, 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 uh, this is for maximality. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Another, any questions? Okay, then uh, if there's no more, then let's thanks to the speaker again. Thank you.
Okay, so the, the last talk of this morning section will be delivered by uh, Oliver Che from Einhoven University of Technology. And uh, he's going to talk about the optimal control of scalar conservation law with particle approximations, please. Thank you, Young Bill. Um, how much time do I have? What's lunchtime? When's lunchtime? You have uh, 15 minutes. But I want to be nice to the people, no? So, okay. All right, um, thank you so much, especially to the organizers um, for the invitation and also for organizing in such a way that I can kind of just cite stuff from Helene and, and also Julia. So they've talked a lot about um, just optimization in the space of probability measures. And somehow this is kind of going slightly further um, in the sense that uh, eluded already um, by Daniela on, on, um, on yesterday, which in her last slide, I think she mentioned extensions to congestion. And um, what I'm going to talk about is, in fact, a dynamics where there is congestion involved. And I want to come up with an optimal optimization strategy for this type of uh, 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 models. But from a kind of microscopic description, so particles, and to derive essentially necessary conditions, so op first order optimality conditions from the particle level to give an idea of what the necessary conditions should look like on the functional level. Okay, so this is this is the the business, the game, and um, yes. So yeah, let's let's move on. All right. So that's the goal. <clears throat> the goal is to minimize um, some function phi, and uh, rho is now a function. Okay, an L one an L one function. And L is the Lebesgue measure. So what the, the type of functionals I'm going to be working with is kind of functionals on measures. Subject to something that looks like this. So this is essentially just a transport equation. It's one dimension. It's the simplest case I can think of. Um, and it's already too hard for me to study. So in the next few slides, I will reduce the problem more and more. But as I reduce them, I will introduce some references and tell you kind of briefly how I got into this problem. OK, so you have um, the continuity equation, but the flux is the row, the usual row. And I have a beta row, which is a nonlinear function, which I'll tell you a little bit more in a bit. But this encodes the congestion. And then there is a force. The force uh, is maybe a mean field type force, which can depend on row itself and on some control w. And I have two control parameters here, the w and the u. So the initial data is also controlled. Um, and there were so many pictures already that, that you've seen earlier this morning. So uh, Helene gave you a, a big variety of uh, um, images, so I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to show you a, a video of um, the type of dynamics you can, you can uh, um, describe. So if you look here, maybe around this area, you will see in a few, uh, there, there, you see? So congestion start happening. Right, so this is kind of to modulate the local density of, of, your, of your dynamics, and you don't want it to achieve, I mean, go beyond a certain threshold. Okay, so, um, and the goal is to find a convenient numerical approach to solving this optimal control problem. So, again, very pragmatic. I want to come up with an algorithm that does this. I'm going to make some assumptions, so don't read too much into detail on, on this. So F is just some nice vector field. Um, phi, I'm going to take something like the Wasserstein distance. I'm not going to reintroduce it again because it's already been introduced. Something like the Wasserstein distance between uh, the measure nu and some fixed measure. So it's essentially, I'm saying I want to go there. Okay, At some time t, I want to kind of minimize this distance. Beta looks something like this, 1 minus s plus. So it's telling you that if the density, the local density, rho exceeds a certain number, stop. Okay, So the maximum density, local density, that rho can have at the moment is 1 for this example. So uh, I'm going to assume that phi is WP continuous, uh, and beta is satisfies some nice properties. But it, it's always decreasing. All right. By the way, if there are any questions at any point in time, I will make Yongpil take the mic and run around. OK, so just ask. OK, so the type of examples I want to look at is something like this, impulsive patchy control, where you have um, um, fields, 
that uh, or I would say velocity fields that look like this, the sum of just WJs, WJs are time dependent, and F are just fixed locations. And then you have also non-local control type where you include uh, row. So this is completely independent of row. This one you include row. You ask the local density and you're saying, how do I tune by just applying some kind of uh, weights that are time dependent to control the, the, the the cluster kind of the density distribution. Okay. All right, so let's look at what happens when beta is equal to one. And this is the case where you've seen already a lot of technology being developed from the first and second talk of this morning. There is a, yes, so, and, and in fact, it goes all the way back already to 2014, maybe probably earlier, but just um, let me mention, um, this paid this earlier papers and then a couple of papers also, yeah. That uh, uh um. I, I think this was also cited earlier, Bonet Franskovska, and um, in the same year we also came up with a paper with with Claudia, we came up with um. An approach which it which is slightly different, because it came from a kind of mar uh, particle. But um, we were interested in adjoint-based uh, optimization, so which meant we needed to compute the adjoints. Um, and we wanted to relate the adjoints of the, the particle system to the, the adjoints of the, the limiting, the mean field system. And the, the, the point was that um, in standard optimal control strategy, when you're in the mean field scenario, the people that we were used to talking to, they did adjoints based on the L2 calculus. But now we are in the space of measures, then the calculus has to change. The question is how? Um, and so we kind of gave an approach and the approach, I, I will maybe, yeah, so let me, okay. So I'm gonna kind of just mention a little bit about how the approach works and it's very easy. The idea is the following. So you take um, forces or say uh, velocities that look like this. This is exactly the same as uh, what Julia wrote down. Her W was there. Okay, and the K was the W, something like this. W is a control, and what you do is you can say, I, I take a particle representation. So if I have linear mobility, I'm allowed to take a particle representation, and in fact, the particle representation solves the, the continuity equation exactly. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between uh, this particle representation and this one for beta equal to one. Uh, where you, yeah, so rho n here is just uh, the empirical measure. And then if you were to, on the particle level, do an adjoint-based calculus, so you take the derivative and you construct the adjoint, you will arrive at an adjoint equation. Okay, that looks like this. And then what you do is you say, I define what I call a momentum. What is the momentum? The momentum is just the empirical measure times the weights. And what are the weights? The weights are the adjoint variables. And then I take the time derivative with a test function and I arrive in fact with a momentum equation that looks like this. So this is the adjoint. This is the, I would say, the correct adjoint. Why? Because on the space of probability measures, we know kind of say, let's say P2 or W in, in the, with W2 metric, you know that your tangent bundle is uh, L2 mu, okay? And the adjoint, the corresponding adjoint to L2 mu should look should, is the is the dual variable to the L two mu. Okay, so again, this is exact. This is pre limit exact. So the business is just well, if I can pass to the limit n to infinity in this equation, I derive the proper first order optimality conditions for the space of in, in the space of probability measures. Okay, this is the idea. So don't don't read too much into this bracket. This bracket is just a kind of a this bracket I learned from Yong Pil, it's a commutator of this operator. And U is the Radon Nicodim derivative of M with respect to rho N. Okay, so this is it. Um, and then you can derive the optimality, con optimality conditions from the particle system directly using this approach. Okay. Now um, I'm gonna simplify things a little bit. So this is the that was the first part. So we worked a little bit on this and how to derive. The second part is where beta is no longer constant. But I'm going to simplify it a little bit where I say, well, uh, the force is something like this. So now I'm, I have mean field dynamics, but of gradient, maybe gradient flow type. 
my control, I've removed the control variable in this, uh, uh, the, the force. In fact, uh, Yop over there, my PhD student of mine, he's working where the control variable isn't there. So I'm not going to talk about this. E is some nice energy functional. Everything remains the same. And, and then there is a result with uh, Simone de Fagioli, which states the following, that this equation has a grain flow structure, a rigorous one. And the grain flow structure is relative, is with respect to a weighted Wasserstein type distance, which means the moment I have a nonlinear mobility, I have to leave the Wasserstein space. The Wasserstein distance is not my metric. And it should not be the metric that I should consider. It should be a weighted metric. Okay? Um, and in fact, it looks like this. So you, you can rewrite this equation rigorously in this, in this form. So again, here you have the energy dissipation balance or the, the de Georgi in in energy dissipation identity, which tells you that solutions of this can be characterized by variation of principle that looks like this. Okay, where importantly, R takes this form. So R is the dissipation potential, or this is, this is going to give you the metric. You can think of it as a metric tensor. And where J is the flux, that's, that's the flux. But I have to take the flux relative to the density, which is rho times beta. Okay? So this is, this is what I mean by weighted. Of course, if beta is 1, then you arrive at the classical Wasserstein distance, the Wasserstein 2 distance. Beta not equal to 1, you get something else. Okay? So already at this level, you kind of see, well, if I want to do proper calculus in this space of probability measures, relative to the dynamics that I'm, I'm looking at, then maybe you should take a different metric. Maybe. Okay. okay, so, and how do we get here? We got here, we managed to prove this result by using a, a particle approximation. So follow the leader type approximation, which was introduced by Marco um, Di Francesco and uh, Rossini here in 2015. Um, so I, I do have to say that uh, yes, I do have to say that if beta is, so if rho times beta rho is not concave, then you cannot apply the standard uh, ambrosio gili savare technique, uh, uh, kind of the minimizing movement scheme, essentially, to, to construct solutions. So you have even counterexamples for where this does not work. So that's why you have, we had to use a different uh, approach. Okay, so there is a particle approximation. And on top of that, we, we, use it, uh, we use an evolutionary gamma convergence approach to prove uh, the, the structure, the rigorous structure. So based on this, I, I kind of believed, well, maybe if I want to deal with optim optimization or come up with kind of the first of the order optimality condition from the particle dynamics, then the choice of the particle dynamics will play a role. And which choice I make I choose this one simply because it gives me, it has a nice structure, okay? All right. Um, yes, so I'm gonna reduce it even more. I'm gonna just say, now let's throw the, 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 this other things away and just focus on the scalar conservation law. Okay? And in fact, this one is already hard enough. Why? Um, uh, yes, I'm gonna take admissible controls, which uh, I also used the same notation U for admissible controls. Um, yes, and based the same assumption, exactly the same assumption. And the goal is to solve this. Again, using an adjoint based approach. And this is difficult enough. Why? Because the solution map is not differentiable. The solution map uh, from L1 to L1. So I'm going to start with an initial data. So this is my control. And at time t, so after evolving, this map that assigns u to rho of t, this is not going to be differentiable. And uh, since 97, so Bresan Guerra, they have, because of this non-differentiability, they needed to introduce different notions of differentiability. So here they introduced uh, the notion of shift differentiability. Boshu James, I think they worked with a notion of differentiability, which was by duality, so they talked about dual solutions, du duality solutions, I think they call them. Um, Ulbricht also worked um, 
kind of very similar to the shift differentiability, but Doche Pirano, I, I don't know what they do there. I, I tried understanding it, but it was quite uh, technical and they made it for very specific equations. Um, Michel Hattie also worked on this. So here they used, uh, if, if I'm not mistaken, they used the front tracking, so kind of approach to come up with a, a optimality condition. So you see already that because of these issues, it's not very easy to handle. And more importantly, I don't really care about L1 differentiability because my phi is going to be something that is maybe differentiable in the space, in the Wasserstein space. Okay, so um, yes, that's the goal again. But more than that, I want an adjoint based approach derived from a particle approximation. Okay, so this is the agenda. I'm going to tell you about the particle approximation because this is different. This, I, can, I cannot just take Dirac deltas, yes, I have to do something different. And you will, you should be, you should see this again tomorrow um, by the, in the talk of Emanuela. And then I'm I'm going to talk about the discrete optimal control problem, and try to connect it with the continuous optimal control problem. And then I'm going to kind of give hints on what the adjoints could be like. Okay, so let's start with this. The first one. So what's the idea? The idea is to take the equation on the top, I mean 1D. So I'm allowed to take the pseudo inverse. What is the pseudo inverse? I first integrate over the equation, which gives me the cumulative distribution function. We know that the cumulative distribution function is monotonically increasing. So I can take the pseudo inverse of this guy. This will give me this function x. And I can rewrite that equation in terms of the function x, and I end up with something looking like this. And this is the equation I discretize. So x is kind of the particle location based on mass variable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my mass variable. My measure is going to be unit mass. So my, ma so my interval is just 0, 1. And I choose n, and I slice this 0, 1 to n uh, uh, um, I mean sections. And then I look at uh, the particle. So it maps from 0, 1 to the space R. Okay? So these are essentially, this describes my particle. And I'm going to approximate this kind of just with the forward difference. Of course, the question is why the forward difference and not the backward difference? Um, because the forward difference will lead you to entropy solutions when you pass to the limit. And the backward difference will not give you entropy solutions. So somehow, the notion of entropy solutions forces you to make a particular choice of what's happening. OK. Um, yeah, so this was already introduced in uh, this, this paper by Di Francesco and Rossi in 2015. Okay, what is the particle approximation? Based on this, I do precisely this. I replace the x with xi, the dot, equal beta of rho i. What is rho i? Rho i is just h divided by this difference, forward minus the, the current. And I'm going to make sure that um, I stay within this set, in fact. So in my initial data should be in this Kn. The Kn is just telling you that, um, so remember, my beta is going to go down. And after this m, it's going to be 0. So I expect my the, the, the L infinity norm of this density is never going to be above m. So I'm making sure somehow that my rho i's are always bounded from above by m. Okay. And in fact, this is an invariant set. If I run my dynamics, it will stay here. And so this is just a kind of a pictorial description of, uh, of how I yeah, recon kind of uh, define my, my objects. Now, um, yes, so how do we kind of start? So usually, I, I give you a, a function, L1 function, that, have, that has unit mass. And how do I find these initial xi points? And what do I do is the following. I take my u, which again has L infinity bounds, m. And I need to determine this x in this set. What I do is I choose my first point. That's the support of, uh, of the function on one side, the left-hand side. And then I, move, I choose the point such that the integral up to this point of this my original function is equal to h. Okay? So I equidistribute the mass. And by doing so recursively, I get my points. And then from these points, I run my simulation. OK, um, the, the important thing, and this is the reason why we were able to prove that 
the particle system in fact converges to a grain flow solution of the original, the continuous problem, is because the particle system itself has a grain flow structure. Right, that we, we use kind of to, to, I mean, that's the reason why we can use evolutionary gamma convergence. Okay, um, but it's not super interesting or important at this moment. Now, we have particles, but we need to be able to compare them with uh, what's happening in the continuous level. Then we take kind of a piecewise reconstruction. So it looks something like that. Yeah, so you just take, I'm sorry, this is not P, this should be the row I, this typo here. So row I, kind of supported on Ki. Remember Ki, I just have to mention, Ki is x the interval Xi to Xi plus one, including Xi and not including Xi plus one. So this choice is very important, as you will see maybe very close to the end. Okay, um, and the flux, so I can write down a continuity equation and what is the flux corresponding to this um, dynamics? The flux is nothing but a convex combination or interpolation between the, the betas at row i and the beta at row i plus one. Okay, so this is this is it. And then from here you can pass the limits and, and recover your solutions. So what is well known is that um, if u is uh, in u and x bar is in this kn, these are equimass partitions, then the row x, so the reconstruction based on the particle, is going to be in u for all times. So it's invariant, and we have also um, a, a total variation bound. So if it's if I start with u, that's BV, the the total variation. Uh, so the BV norm uh, kind of persists, right? Which this gives you compactness and everything you need. Uh, we also know that uh, yeah, this is the the results of uh, uh, with Simona Fagioli, that the reconstruction it converges to not only an entropy solution but also to the W beta gradient flow solution. Okay, so when I say entropy, I mean Kruskov entropy. All right, so um, now to talk about stability estimates, I need to first at least show that uh, the particle system is, is well behaving, right? And why I expect why I expect to be able to do something with it is that because so because of this this estimates. Uh, so x and y are these particles, and again remember rho x rho superscript is always a reconstruction, the, the piecewise constant reconstruction based on the particles. And you can show the following result. So WP is less or equal to W infinity, and here for any P, including infinity. And it's not possible to take this one to be something else. You can find examples where this is not true. Um, and in fact, from this, you can derive uh, the same inequality, but on the level of the measures. So in some sense, so this was this this type of result was proven in uh, in this earlier paper in 2006 with uh, with uh, Jose Antonio Carrillo, some Di Francesco and Latanzio. Then um, they use kind of a different approach, but from the particle approximation, it's very easy to conclude this result. Um, and the idea is the following: if you were to use this particle approximation, you can explicitly explicitly represent the Wasserstein distance. The WP distance is nothing but, so I, I put here Q superscript X. What this is, is essentially um, a convex combination. Okay, so this is a, and it's Lipschitz. This is a Lipschitz reconstruction based on the, the endpoints, the values on RI and RI plus one. So you can explicitly write the, the WP to the power P distance between these two piecewise constant reconstructions as this, this object here. And then so essentially what you need to do is show that the dynamics in R is not is behaving well. Um, more importantly, there is a direct relationship between that object and the, the usual transport. So T superscript XY is the, the transport map that maps the reconstruction of X with the reconstruction of Y. So this, this is it. So what you can show is a, a bound looking like this with a dx. Okay. So what this tells you is that um, you get an inequality looking like this. So it tells you that if you have a transport map, so if your initial, so you have two, two say, uh, functions, u and w, and you have a transport map between the corresponding measures, 
And if these tra th this transport map is um, of bounded variation, which is typical because as soon, in fact, as soon as you have measures that have Lebesgue densities, then you always find a, a transport map such that this is a, this is true. But these bounds they propagate along the dynamics. So this is something that I, I've, I've not seen before. So it, it, it's actually quite interesting. Okay. Um, yes. So now let's talk about the discrete optimal control problem and its connection with uh, the continuous one. So we start again with this problem. And then we ask the question, well, our first question is to ask is, is there a minimizer to this problem? And the answer is yes. So the optimal control problem, the finite dimensional one, super easy. You just apply all the, the calculus of variation techniques you know. This works. More importantly is the following. If phi is WP continuous, then the family of functionals defined by the following. So it's just saying that uh, this is an extended functional that tells you if um, if I'm not of this form, if I'm not of a piecewise constant reconstruction form, then it takes plus infinity. Okay. So this functional is weakly coercive in the L1 topology, and it gamma converges to our, my original functional in the weakly in L1. Okay. So what this means is, in fact, if I have a sequence of minimizers for this problem, it will converge to the minimizer of the my original problem. Any questions so far? Okay. Um, yeah, so let's let's look at um, necessary conditions for this particle system. So I'm gonna yeah, so I'm gonna assume that in addition to continuity, I'm gonna assume that it's differentiable because I need to take derivatives in some meaningful sense. And so what differentiability here means, I, you've already seen it, in fact, um, from the previous talks. Is uh, so phi is WP differentiable if there exists some zeta in LP mu, for which this is true. So the difference for arbitrary nu is equal to zeta times this transport minus identity d mu plus little o of WP. Okay. So this um, this I'm going to assume for all time. In fact, I'm going to give you an example and I'm going to work mainly with this example. This example is the following. I give you some new, some fixed new, say the indicator function of a set, normalized in PAC. So P is a yeah, so absolutely continuous measure. And I define a phi superscript new applied to mu as just well, half of W2 squared. And this guy is differentiable because uh, this guy is differentiable at any point mu that is also absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue. So the observation is the following. Let's assume that all my measures are now parameterized by these piecewise constant reconstructions. So I have x, y, z in this kn. And uh, nu is equal to the piecewise reconstruction. Then I can write it down as the following. So I know explicitly what my zeta is. My zeta takes the form q superscript x and the difference of z and x. So remember, Q superscript X is just the, um, the convex reconstructions, kind of the, the Lipschitz reconstruction in the interval given the two endpoints. Okay. Now, I can rewrite this in the following form, where LN is just some operator and that, is, uh, that has inverse that is uniformly bounded in N, and it's a, it's a nice behaving operator. And from here, I'm going to postulate a discrete adjoint equation. So in fact, you can you don't have to postulate it. You can just by hand compute using the extended Lagrangian very, very formally. And then you postulate it. Now the question is, why is this the correct object to look at? Uh, yes, maybe let me, it's, it's very hard to see why this is the adjoint, but uh, you have to believe me for now, okay? The more important thing is at P capital T, this is equal to that object that is sitting here. Okay, so let's look at why this is in fact the case. So if I take the difference, I know the explicit formula for, because well, W2 again is uh, differentiable. So I know the explicit formula for this zeta, this is over here. And I rewrite it according to what I, you've seen earlier. This is simply equal to H times LN of this, the difference in the vectors. And then I'm gonna use the stability estimate for this guy here, uh, my apologies, this should be a little o or essentially o squared. 
So this should be a, a square there. So this guy is bounded from above by this object here. So this is precisely the W infinity between the two, uh, the, the two initial measures, okay? Because we know that this one can be controlled by the W infinity of the initial, okay? So that's stability. And you have also a lower bound. So if you apply the adjoint equation that I, I showed you earlier, oh, it's, it's right on the top there. You, what you can do is you can make this computation. You can shift the information from cap time capital T to, to uh, time zero, okay? But you incur error, and the error is over here, and this is a bad error. Remember, H is this discretization parameter that, in fact, I want to send to zero or N going to infinity, but you have the one over H, so I'm not allowed to do this in this computations. But at least on the particle level, fix N or fix H, I know that I have a derivative information. The derivative is given by this object. Okay, so the, the adjoint is the correct thing. Uh, the, the adjoint equation is the right one. Okay, so let's just summarize the, the necessary conditions uh, that, that we have. We have the discrete state equation. We have the discrete adjoint, which we just showed that it's the, the right thing to look at. And we have the optimality condition, which simply reads the following. Okay. And now comes the question, how does this adjoint equation translate to the continuum equation? So what's the continuous counterpart to this, this object right here? Okay, so let's recall our adjoint equation and let's look back at what we've done for the uh, beta equal one case. So the beta equal one, remember, I have a particle system and I make this kind of a, kind of just reconstructions in a, in a very simple fashion. And then we arrive at something that's continuous. So this is kind of recalling what we saw earlier. Now, what if we were to do the same? Okay, so let's do the following. Let's take MN to be the same object, except P now is equal to, uh, P satisfies that adjoint equation. Now I can make a simple computation again. And here is the interesting part. Here, I really re need that row n is supported on the closed interval xi and open xi plus one. Why? Because in order to actually make, to write this down, I need that, um, that, uh, that one of the, well, they, they, are, they are not doing stupid things because I have products of measures with some function. Okay, and this function is only L1. So I need to make sure that th these objects are meaningful. So uh, that, that's why I kind of define that following way. And there is this epsilon term, and this epsilon term will in fact vanish as n go to infinity. Now the question is then, finally, ah uh, yes, so what we can prove is the following, that we can prove that there exists some m, limiting m, and some lambda measure for which this is true. So question, what is lambda? Can I identify lambda in the limit? And this is the conjecture, right? The conjecture is that lambda will take, if I read off here, lambda will take this form, but this proof is, I would say very, yeah, I, I don't know yet. So this is a conjecture and my conjecture may be wrong. So if you find a reason that this is not the case, please let me know so I don't keep trying to prove this. Okay, but uh, I, I mean, in some sense, this is, I don't know if I would use the word what I expect, because if I look at the beta equal one case, it looks very similar. It looks, in fact, like this, plus another term, okay? Um, and I expect another term because I'm differentiating. So um, if you're familiar with uh, maybe, um, I don't know, I, so internal energies and pressures. So this is kind of a, a pressure. So the minus of the pressure corresponding to beta, this, this beta function, which I'm not sure if there is a physical meaning to this. Okay, um, yes, so let's finally summarize. So I, I talked about the particle approximation and the relevance. In fact, um, I showed you kind of a nice stability estimates, particularly this one, because this is kind of, I would say new. 
And I'm not so sure it's very if it's very easy to get if you kind of just work directly on the space of measures, but maybe it's possible. Um, and I talked about the discrete optimal control problem and how it connects to the, the continuous one using gamma convergence and also the kind of derive the necessary conditions and the discrete adjoint. And finally, um, yeah, I talked about the discrete momentum plus a conjecture, hoping that this is going to be the case. Finally, and um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, are there any questions or comments? I have a very basic one since you are trying to introduce some new effects into your dynamics like congestion. Uh, it seems that this point of view may be powerful. Could it also include some additional effects like noise, diffusion terms, or something like that? It's a good question. Um... So I think including the noise, it's a little bit more on the technical side because well, what's happening is that um, if you're in the one dimensional case, the particles will not cross because of the, yeah? So you, you don't expect the, the particles to cross. So you're, you're saying congestion plus noise or just beta equal one and noise? Both. <laughs> okay, so congestion plus noise is very tricky because uh, congestion tells you that in fact, you have a reordering of the, I mean, you have an ordering of the points and you are not allowed to cross. In fact, you're not allowed to touch a certain level. But the noise will, will allow you to jump over these points, which will uh, make sure that, I mean, it tells you that your particles are not going to, the dynamics will not be invariant in this set uh, U that I, I mentioned. So um, on the other hand, if you have beta equal one, this is a possibility because you don't, so, Virtually, you don't care about the ordering of the points. So this, I think, if you look at the so there is a work by um by Marc Pelletier and um yeah with Pierre Nyquist and and another person where they in fact look at the possibility of uh, uh, the points jumping over the other person um, and or from a particle dynamics also in one D. This you can do, um, but, but using the this kind of uh, this deterministic particle approximation, maybe it's a little bit trickier. Yeah, but it might be, it's, it's an interesting question, yes. It was also an interesting answer, thank you. Okay. Oh. oh, thank you, Oliver. Uh, so it works actually in a single lane, right? Okay. Uh, what happens in the multi-lane case? So if you are two lanes that are coupled, do you think you can extend somehow what you presented? It's an interesting question. Um, so I've not gone into systems yet, but it would be definitely... Uh, so part of Yope's work is to extend it to networks, but still single lane, but not to systems yet. So this we should try. As in, like you and me, we should try. Thank you. And uh, any other other questions? Okay. Then uh, if there is no more, then let's thanks the speaker again. Thank you. All right. So welcome everybody back to the afternoon session. I'm happy to introduce Dante Kalise. He is from Imperial College and will talk about multi-scale feedback control synthesis for interacting particle systems. So stage is yours. Uh, thank you, Claudia. Um, sorry, how much time do I have? 50 minutes? Eh? Yeah. 50, yes. 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 Wonderful. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Claudia. Uh, thanks everyone for being there after the lunch. Um, I apologize, I couldn't be there, and I, I really mean it. I really wanted to go, but I really overestimated uh, my my physical strength because I just spent a few weeks uh, in Chile and now just came back and a bit jet lag and yeah, need to take care of myself a little bit. Uh, so I'm very sorry that I have to torture with uh, an online talk. Uh, I'll try to make it as uh, entertaining as possible, but uh, yeah, 
apologies for this. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, interacting particle systems, of course, as, as the topic of the workshop, but also about uh, control at, at different uh, scales. Mm -hmm. So really this talk is structured around the different scales that you are going to observe, starting from the microscopic uh, aspects of this, really going to uh, passing by some kinetic equations. And at the very end, I will show some uh, recent results that we have on uh, control of the Fokker-Planck uh, equation. Okay. Um, well, there are many people involved here, many colleagues, but um, uh, most particularly uh, this uh, handsome guy that you see there, uh, Giacomo, uh, uh, Greg Pagliotti is from Imperial, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of uh, everything that you need to know about the Fogger-Planck equation, uh, and Sara Vichego, a PhD, of, PhD student of mine, that uh, she has been working on, on many of the computational things that you are going to see uh, in this talk. Uh, I always start here, but uh, it's really, this is from Strogat's book on nonlinear dynamics. Uh, somehow establishes a taxonomy of what we consider to be interesting uh, examples, uh, problems to study about in, in terms of uh, how many variables they have and, and how rich is uh, their nonlinear behavior. Uh, so here today, we're going to be looking probably at what we understand as non-equilibrium statistical mechanics, agents-based models, uh, mean field limits, uh, thinking about uh, nonlinear dynamical behavior, uh, and with many agents, and probably agents also will live in a very high-dimensional space themselves. As you can think, agents, for instance, are agents taking decisions in, in financial markets. The, the, the inherent state of, this, of a single agent is already a, a high-dimensional uh, problem. But in general, uh, this is also somehow related to control of densities and control of fluids. So at the very end, I'm going to show you some pictures of things related to uh, fluid flow control as, as it's also a closely uh, related topic. Um, probably many of you have seen these slides, but what I want to see here is, is a bit different today because I think that the main two features of what I want to talk uh, is about feedback and, and of course, uh, multi-scale modeling. Uh, so this picture is always about agent-based uh, models and problems, for instance, in collective animal behavior uh, or swarm robotics, as, as you can see here, uh, we're really were interested in uh, feedback control. So here we want to induce uh, a behavior in the system uh, through the action of an external signal from, from a control. Uh, for instance, you would like to control uh, birds through the action of a, of a drone to, to do guidance problems, to do swarm robotics, to stabilize um, a, a swarm of drones around a formation. Uh, but the important feature here is really that this control signal uh, cannot be computed uh, solely based, say, on Pontryagin type of optimality conditions, uh, you really need to aim for a feedback law for a controller that depends on the whole state of the system at all times, mm -hmm. uh, which is very different than just doing sort of calculus variations, uh, inspire computation, where you determine the optimal action for a, for a given initial condition, because in practice, these systems are unstable and, and you wouldn't be able in reality to stabilize such systems with just Pontryagin conditions. So we really need to think about dynamic programming and about the synthesis of uh, feedback controls, uh, of control signals that can be expressed as a mapping from the current state of the system uh, to, to the action. Uh, the second aspect, of course, uh, in, in line with this workshop is uh, that I would like to talk about uh, to somehow the control design should exploit the multi-scale behavior of this. So at the very first, in the very first part of the talk, I would like to uh, discuss what we can do at the microscopic scale. So when you really have uh, some large, very large scale uh, no linear dynamical system which we want to control and then to discuss a little bit up to which point uh, is it is it beneficial to instead of working with the microscopic state of the system to move towards densities and to cast this as a, a non-local uh, transport equation for which we can control uh, say in a bilinear fashion the density and, and to steer the density of agents uh, towards a certain target. Uh, I'll come back to this later on. 
Uh, but really, I think here there is room for everything. I mean, if, if you think about uh, swarm robotics or microscopic control, uh, you really don't want to use a uh, mean field modeling. You really would like to stick uh, to controlling the microscopic drone dynamics. Uh, but for instance, here in this plot, I have a, an example on opinion dynamics, and then it would make sense. There is, is a bit pointless to try to control uh, the opinion of, of a reagent. You really want to think about densities. So I don't think there is a, a close answer to this. It really depends on, on from your modeling, whether you really want to do microscopic control or you want to move to a mean field control or, or maybe in between a stopic at a genetic level, uh, it's, it's enough. So really, as I say, the, the, the talk then is going to be structured about uh, going really from microscopic control, then how can we recycle this in a, in a genetic framework, and at the very end to discuss results for the uh, feedback control, sorry, of a uh, Fogger plank, uh, so mean field, mean field control. Um, so here the first part is really a bit microscopic control. This is a... Uh, is, a, is an old story. Many people in the audience have to contribute to this. So we have uh, nonlinear interactive particle systems uh, where, where without control, uh, many people have studied these for, for ages. Uh, we have interaction forces, attraction, repulsion, and, and of course the, the main feature is the self-organization. So you start from a disorganized state and after some time, uh, some very rich nonlinear uh, dynamical behavior emerges. For instance, here I'm, I'm showing some examples uh, on where you have uh, miles, uh, where you have meals, and then you also have flogging behavior. And you can study the transition uh, between these two states or, or well, consensus emergence, uh, you name it. Of course, what, what I'm interested here is not in the, in the problem as a nonlinear dynamical system. I really want to go one step beyond and, and think about the, the inclusion of a control term here. So how can uh, I and how can I enforce uh, some of this behavior or transition uh, between these two states uh, or these different different states through the action of an external control synthesis and how should I go about uh, designing such a signal? Mm -hmm. So of course this is a classical control problem. So no linear dynamics having an external forcing trying to induce a behavior in the system. Uh, and for instance, in but many of the things ha haven't been, uh, they still remain somehow uh, open questions. So for instance, in this this paper in, in 2022 from, with uh, Jose Garrillo, Rossi, and, and Emmanuel Trela, we really study this problem from, from a theoretical, say, control design, controllability perspective. So a very first question before going, jumping into the synthesis by optimal control, I would say a valid question would be to ask, whether it is possible uh, to move, for instance, from meals to flocks or to go uh, back and forth from these different regimes, uh, where they have a basing of attraction, trying to characterize it. And at the very end, once you already know that it's possible to drive uh, between these different states of the system, uh, to think about uh, how to compute uh, these controls. And of course, my answer would be, uh, let's do optimal control, let's do model predictive control, uh, feedback uh, loss, uh, whatever. But but still, from a controllability perspective, these are still uh, open problems. They, they are also, they are even open at the mean field level, as I will discuss a bit later. Uh, one would also, somehow this question relates to optimal transfer problems and, 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 and questions about whether you can control a fulgur plank equation from one density to, to another. But here at the microscopic level is a classical nonlinear uh, controllability uh, question. Uh, but of course, if, if now you know that you are able to transit between these two regimes, uh, you want to think about synthesis. So how do we compute actually this, this control law? And as I was saying earlier, I think a main requirement here should be that the control is a feedback law. Uh, and in this sense, uh, the main tool that we have for constructing optimal feedback laws is dynamic programming or the hamilton jacobi bellman uh, PD. So very briefly, uh, you will have a nonlinear dynamical system. Uh, here, you will have a control goal uh, and dynamic programming works with the value function of the control problem. Uh, the value function is the optimal cost to go. So how much does it cost from a given initial condition X uh, to achieve the optimal uh, trajectory? 
So this is encoded in this object. And of course, dynamic programming works uh, with the hamilton jacob equation, which is a partial differential equation for the value function. Uh, it's a nonlinear, uh, fully nonlinear in non-divergence form PD. So the nonlinearity is a first issue here that, that, that appears, uh, first order in the deterministic case, uh, second order PD in the stochastic uh, case. Uh, but of course, the main feature, the main drawback here is that the hamilton jacob equation itself is cast in the state space of the dynamical system. And if you think now about microscopic agent-based models, uh, this means that you really need to solve a, a very, very, very high dimensional uh, nonlinear partial differential equation. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the reward comes, of course, that once you are able to solve the hamilton jacob equation, uh, the optimal control truly comes as a, as a feedback law. So it does not depend anymore on the initial condition. It's a mapping that gives you the optimal action in any point of the state space. So you can think about any configuration of agents at any time, uh, you will have the right answer of what is the optimal action to do in that very moment. Mm -hmm. uh, based on a very cheap calculation, once of course provided that you have solved the PD, uh, you have solved for V or gradient of V, which will be the, the feedback map store it somewhere and you are able, uh, able to call it. This is, um, I always like to make this point, although this is uh, perhaps not your, your main interest here in terms of, of uh, hamilton jacob equations, but for instance, there is this paper of, of Wayne Nane, a recent, is a sort of survey that, that is interesting about uh, uh, deep learning techniques uh, in, in applying mathematics, in, in solving partial differential equations, uh, uh, perhaps you are aware that there is a big hype on, on using deep learning and unrelated techniques to solve uh, PDEs. Um, I personally think that we don't need to need, need to do this for the for the heat equation or for navier Stokes or for things that we have been working uh, for for decades. Uh, but uh, it does make sense. This is precisely the PDE for it, which makes sense to use deep learning because. Uh, here, the, the object that you're trying to approximate lives in a very, very high dimensional space. Is that It does not live in three plus one dimensions like any uh, physics-based, uh, physics-inspired PD. We're thinking here about nonlinear uh, PD in, in, in a huge dimensional space, uh, infinite dimensional if you work with densities. Uh, and here, you would really like to think about machine learning or deep learning type techniques uh, that I'm going to briefly discuss in, 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 a, in a few slides. Um, so for one second, I'll come back later uh, very briefly. I mean, I'll come back to the agent-based models, but of course, at this point, uh, one has to stop and think more generally about uh, how you how you go about controlling uh, computing optimal feedback loss for uh, large-scale nonlinear systems. How do we solve uh, the hamilton jacob equation uh, for nonlinear dynamical systems? Uh, this, of course, this nonlinear dynamical system uh, in our case, has a very clear meaning, is really the microscopic dynamics of the agent-based models, but the technique here is very, uh, very general. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, uh, over the last, uh, say, I would say six, uh, seven years, there has been a, a tremendous amount of work on, on the use of uh, machine learning or deep learning type techniques uh, to solve the very high dimensional uh, hamilton jacob equations, partly inspired uh, by uh, the need of uh, very high dimensional feedback solvers uh, for agent base uh, or multi-agent systems. Mm -hmm. uh, this somehow I always tell that this is an old story coming from, from Bersegas in the 90s. At that point, it was not called deep reinforcement learning. They used to call it neurodynamic programming and it didn't have very good press. Uh, but uh, recently, of course, people have uh, gone crazy about working on this and now uh, everybody's working on deep reinforcement learning. Uh, but yeah, these things have been around, uh, plus minus some technological updates that we have been having in GPUs and, and computing power. Uh, but most notably in 2017, there was this deep BSD solver by Wayne Anehan and, and Jensen uh, that is basically using the feynman cac formula as a representation formula for the hamilton jacob equation related to stochastic control problems uh, as a way to generate data and to train a neural network that approximates the solution of the hamilton jacob equation. And many methods so, uh, follow from there. For instance, what is called the Galerkin method, which is uh, just a residual minimization on the hamilton jacob equation with a neural network ansatz. Uh, and then 
you have just a, a myriad of, of techniques using deep neural networks uh, to solve hamilton jacob equations. Uh, what is particular somehow here is that many of these techniques, they circumvent solving the BDE. Uh, as I will show you, they use data uh, to somehow uh, interpolate, if you want, in a certain sense, to do regression uh, over the solution of the hamilton jacob equation without actually solving the, the BDE, so circumventing the fact that you have to solve a very, very high dimensional uh, BDE. But of course, as, as you can see in this text that I that I highlighted there uh, below, one has to be very careful about these techniques. Uh, is it does not solve? It's not a silver bullet that will solve everything. Uh, actually, in some cases, these deep learning techniques are really they they fail to give you the accuracy that you would need. For instance, if you were to compute a feedback law uh, for a swarm of drones, for which you want to give a safety guarantee that these drones are not going to collide or do something crazy. Uh, that is going to endanger uh, humans, for instance. Mm. We're still very, very far away in terms of, of safety, of accuracy on, on say, rigorous uh, convergence or accuracy estimates that, then, that would be necessary, for instance, in many uh, engineering applications. Mm. So we're somehow making progress, but we're not quite there in terms of uh, what do we need to claim that we have, for instance, an optimal feedback law that would steer a swarm of drones safely without collisions uh, to do a certain formation in, in space. Um, but then um, I would like, I think, uh, I always tell that perhaps from, from this, uh, this whole talk, uh, this is perhaps the most interesting um, slide. Uh, it somehow summarizes this first part of the, of the talk. Of, of what I'm going to show you now, uh, but really, if if one can get a, a clean message from this talk or learn something perhaps new, is is precisely the the right half of of this uh, slide. So what you have there is the uh, is a hamilton jacobi equation. is the simplest one of the hamilton jacobi say, family. So you have a first order time dependent equation there, and the Hamiltonian is really uh, the norm of the gradient square. And uh, what is interesting about this hamilton jacobi equation is that if you would have a convex initial condition J, then this uh, hamilton jacobi equation does have a, a representation formula, the so-called lax uh, formula, uh, which allows you to retrieve the solution of the hamilton jacobi equation at any point in, in the space-time cylinder Xt uh, by solving a convex optimization problem, which involves J star, which is the convex uh, eventual a conjugate of J. Uh, and this is precisely a very nice uh, convex optimization problem. So uh, the idea here is that the basis of the methods um, that use learning somehow for hamilton jacobi equation exploit this idea that in some cases you might have some sort of representation formula of the hamilton jacobi equation, which allows you uh, to recover solutions uh, po uh, along points, sampling points in, in space-time cylinder without actually solving the, the, the BDE in a classical, say, numerical mathematics sense, uh, in the sense of I will introduce a grid and then I will uh, do a finite element approximation and store this uh, somewhere. So now, um, if you think about progress in convex optimization problem, uh, one could believe that this convex optimization problem there for the representation formula is something that you can really solve in a fraction of a second. Uh, and if you are able to do that, then perhaps it's not necessary anymore to be storing a grid with the solution of V. You can just be fetching values of V as you need them for your optimal control calculation along a given trajectory, a given realization of, of the dynamical system. So this is really convex optimization that helps you to circumvent the solution of the hamilton jacob equation, giving you solutions in real time of the hamilton jacob equation. Of course, uh, the problem here and what is interesting, uh, say, in terms of, of research, is that this lax formula exists only for these, uh, and well, some relatives of this hamilton jacob equation, uh, which for control uh, purposes uh, is not that exciting. 
because here you don't see any dynamics, any running costs. So this really, this, this Hamilton Yago equation is a Hamilton Yago equation, but it's not the one that I would like to solve if I want to compute an optimal feedback law uh, for my engine-based dynamics. So one has to wonder then what is the relevant counterpart uh, of this a hamilton jaco equation in the sense which is a hamilton jaco equation that is relevant for control and what is the, the counterpart of the representation formula of the laxcop formula uh, for that pd uh, that answer actually uh, the the simplest version of that answer is is in any, every optimal control book uh, basically uh, when you have an optimal control problem uh, you will have an optimal feedback law. You will have a nonlinear hamilton yago equation associated to the value function. But also, if you are not interested in the solution globally, you can also think about pontriaging optimality conditions for this problem. Mm -hmm. So, and pontriaging optimality conditions with our necessary optimality conditions uh, come in the form of a two-point boundary value problem where you have the forward equation of the dynamical system coupled with an adjoint equation and a terminal condition and uh, an optimality condition that solves, uh, closes the system in the sense of having as many equations uh, as, as unknowns. Mm -hmm. So in a certain sense, one could think that for the hamilton yago equation here that is relevant uh, for optimal control of nonlinear dynamics, a uh, Pontriani maximum principle is indeed uh, some sort of representation formula uh, for this PD. Uh, the precise statement requires, of course, a bit more technicalities in the sense that this is only valid in the smooth uh, convex case. So the, the very, very narrow case where a uh, Hamilton, uh, so Pontrain conditions, which are uh, necessary optimality conditions, are also sufficient. In that case, you can link somehow uh, Pontrain conditions to characteristic curves of this Hamilton Jacobi uh, PD. So, uh, for a given, assuming that F and G, so the dynamics are smooth, and uh, then what you will have is that the solution of this two point boundary variable problem departing from X. Uh, actually links to, to the solution of the hamilton yago PD across that trajectory by just evaluating uh, the cost along the optimal trajectory from Pontrain that will give you values of V along the optimal trajectory. Uh, and more importantly, the gradient of V is going to be the adjoint variable of this system. Mm -hmm. So now if you think about um, optimal control, this is interesting because uh, the optimal feedback map is going to be a function of V, but actually it's going to be a function of gradient of V. So now uh, you are getting for free by solving a Pontrain condition, you are getting the information of gradient of V, which is the adjoint variable, uh, which is pretty much linked to the optimal feedback map. So uh, what I'm going to do here is just uh, using somehow sampling many initial conditions X in, in space. This, uh, remember that this X, the space where I'm sampling is the state space of the dynamical system. So it's very, very high dimensional. I'm going to sample different conditions on X in parallel. And for each one of them, I'm going to solve Pontrain conditions. Uh, and uh, you have computational solvers based on, on say, nonlinear optimization that make this somehow a feasible task. Definitely much more feasible than uh, just solving the very high dimensional nonlinear partial differential equation. I cannot solve directly this PD on top of there, but I can solve uh, zillions of this problem, of this two point boundary value problem, because it's just solving a couple system of all these. There are no PDs involved here. And then, uh, through these relations here in the bottom, knowing that V is just uh, integrating the cost along the optimal trajectory and that gradient of V is just the adjoint variable in this system, I'm going to create what we call a synthetic data set. So I'm going to create a, a data set that consists of my samples of X, optimal trajectories, optimal adjoints, optimal controls associated to that. And that this will all become a data set uh, for supervised learning. So I'm going to create a neural network uh, or a polynomial approximant uh, of any kind uh, for V, for the value function, or for the gradient of V, for the optimal control. Uh, and I'm going to train this model, this V theta, to match the data of V and gradient of V 
uh, that I have generated from this sampling here uh, below. So this is classical nonlinear regression. I have a model for the value function that depends on parameters, uh, and I will train this model based on the data that I'm recovering from sampling zillions uh, of Pontryagin uh, systems, uh, knowing the link between Pontryagin and the solution of the hamilton jacob equation. Uh, we have done this in, in different ways. Uh, I can tell you here, for instance, uh, we have done this using neural networks uh, with Giacomo and, and with Sara, uh, using um, recurrent neural networks. Uh, we have also uh, done this uh, without neural networks using tensor decompositions. This uh, we've done with uh, uh, Luca Zalusi that may be there in, in the audience, uh, using a tensor train formats, which are just a different format uh, to compress uh, the value function. Mm -hmm. So here, what, what is really interesting is that, of course, these are global uh, approximations of V. So we're not thinking now in a, in a V that is, is stored in a mesh. It's really V that is a set of polynomials. Uh, v is expressed as a certain combination of, of neural networks. Uh, so these are global, nonlinear uh, approximants that scale well in high dimensional settings and for which I can cast a regression problem uh, where I'm learning here uh, the model of V based on samples of V and gradient of V. So going back to the 19th, 18th century, this really dates back, for instance, if you want, uh, to Hermit interpolation. So I'm playing this game where I want to learn a function based on valuations of the function and on the gradient of the function. Is a gradient augmented regression. Um, and uh, within a very, very high dimensional setting, just trying to create a model to match uh, data. And we benchmark these. People nowadays wonder whether this is uh, whether you should do neural networks or tests on trains. Uh, systematically, what we find is that uh, doing tests on trains will give you these low rank approximations of the value functions, give you a more accurate uh, solution. Uh, basically, one order of magnitude more accurate solutions. If you really want to hit a hit, hit a target with a certain a certain accuracy. So, but okay, all this detour is because I really want to construct a feedback law by for my agent based model. This very high dimensional microscopic system. Uh, I want to compute this optimal control, the optimal feedback law by solving the hamilton jaco equation but somehow without solving it, just by solving a supervised, a regression problem. So here you can see the, the outcome, for instance, these are 50 agents in a Sarah Cooker's male model. So we're talking here about a 200 dimensional state space. You want to do a consensus control, you want to induce flocking behavior here uh, globally. So for any initial condition, not just for a, for, for a single one, you want to do optimal feedback regulation in the whole state 200 dimensional state space so that you give me any configuration, I'm able to have this feedback law in real time uh, that goes to consensus. And this is what this is the, the time series that you observe here. This is done with a few thousand samples of the Pontryagin for different initial conditions. For each one, we solve the Pontryagin system that leads you to consensus for that initial condition. And basically we interpolate. I don't want to downplay what we have done, but basically with that data, you can interpolate and create a global object, a neural network uh, that wraps up uh, the, the feedback law that steers any configuration uh, into consensus. So of course here I show you a nice initial configuration, but you can take any, any initial configuration, of course, within certain uh, margins of what we have sample. And in all cases, this feedback law will will bring you to an organized a consensus state. No me feel arguments here. I'm really here working with the hardcore, say very high dimensional uh, microscopic uh, system. So that's what we can do the microscopic scale. But of course, um, if I go back here, I'm here now with uh, 50 agents, uh, 200 dimensional state space. So we have four agents into the four state uh, into the four, for each agent. Uh, eventually, these take a few hours to be computed. 
Uh, and uh, so you might be wondering, well, what's what's the limit of this? If you it really depends on, on on your computational power and your sampling of the Pontrain conditions and so on. But eventually, this will reach a, a limit. Say you cannot solve this for one million agents. Uh, this this is more or less the state of the art to give you an impression of what we can do in in Hamilton Yago equations. Somewhere between two hundred and five hundred states is manageable using neural networks. Uh, but if you are really interested, for instance, in an agent-based system that will have 2,000 uh, uh, agents and you don't want to do the mean field modeling yet, um, you have to think about something. Uh, you have to think about something else. So that gives you me to my second level here of uh, hell, which is um, how to embed these microscopic laws into a kinetic, into mesoscopic dynamics. Hmm? Uh, so um, all what I have discussed here lies here in this bottom step. So uh, given a dynamical system, I can train a neural network uh, for the optimal feedback law. I can do supervised learning and, 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 and that's it. But of course, uh, through a, a kinetic argument, one can think about what is the system that you really want to control? In this case, it would be, for instance, the binary interaction system. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start from the mean field optimal control, from the mean field control problem. That, of course, under rubber scaling goes back to a Boltzmann equation, to sampling interactions between two particles. And, of course, here the twist is that these interactions are controlled. So what I'm going to do here is instead of working with the one million dimensional agent-based model, I'm going to work with the control interactions between two agents. But of course, every time that you go that interaction, in practice, you would have to solve an optimal control problem. Um, as Lorenzo, Varesky, and Giacomo have been doing this for, for a few years with different types of control uh, signals. Uh, here, of course, you wouldn't like to do optimal control because doing the optimal control would be very expensive for that sampling. But precisely what I'm telling from the first part of the talk is actually you could wrap this uh, this optimal feedback law in an offline phase so that when you sample, actually, you don't have to solve any control problem. You just call uh, the neural network that has been already computed for that system. Uh, since it's a, it's a feedback law that lives in the whole space, you can sample anywhere and you will have already in real time the answer uh, without any opt online optimization uh, to retrieve this optimal feedback law for a two-agent system. On the other hand, this two-agent system can be very high dimensional, as I was saying at the very beginning, if the agents uh, themselves are, are high dimensional. Uh, so um, we do this first online part where we train a neural network uh, for the control uh, of a, a of a two agent system, this two agent system uh, it can be very high dimensional, and then this is wrapping a neural network. So really, we enab enable with these uh, some massive Monte Carlo simulations without having to solve a uh, optimal control problem every time that we do the sampling. And of course, then we g this give us uh, an approximation of the Boltzmann equation of the of, of the optimal trajectory of, of the density. Uh, and then of course there is some hope to go to the next level, which is the mean field uh, PD. Uh, I'm sure the audience understand this part of the dog better than me in the sense that uh, through binary interactions here, you are able to mimic, uh, to record this Boltzmann type dynamics that of course require massive sampling of this system. But as I say, this whole system now is wrapping a neural network, so it's extremely cheap to prescribe the say pre-collision states and fetch the, uh, the post-collision uh, post state just by evaluating the uh, neural network. Um, what can we do with this? Uh, we can really now, uh, you can think, for instance, here we have a, just a toy model for opinion dynamics, uh, where the, the opinion dynamics, this is the, the interaction uh, force between, between two agents. Uh, uh, the density here, of course, will tend to clustering, to diverge, uh, and through the action of this sort of neural network that uh, gives you the optimal feedback for two agents and a massive sampling in, in this Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, you are able to record trajectories of the control density where it now clusters towards a single point. I mean, that was our objective in, in, in this case. There are different ways to do, but the main message here is for a two-agent system, 
uh, there is a way to compute the optimal feedback law in a very high dimensional setting, wrap it in a neural network, and then you can do your kinetic solver without having to solve optimal control uh, problems every time that you sample. So it's optimal, but it's also, um, this of course, uh, Jacob and collaborators were able to do it in the past, but with some limitations on the optimality of the control, because it has to be an instantaneous optimal control, something that gives you a closed form solution so that there is also no optimization every time that you sample interaction between two agents. Uh, here now we're able to do it optimally, but we also without solving opt online uh, optimization. And that again, going back to my microscopic example of uh, say consensus, say something like Cooper's main model, now it really enables the solution of massive uh, agent-based system. Now we're thinking about thousands of agents. Uh, of course, there are thousands of samples of interactions between two agents, uh, but somehow this encodes well the behavior of the. Of, you would it wouldn't be feasible to compute the microscopic control with the with the zillion of agents, um, but by iterated samplings of interactions of two by two agents, uh, we're somehow able to recover uh, control uh, densities of, of this system. And again, this is this is computable in real time because we're able to wrap the whole right-hand side, the post-collision uh, post uh, state into a neural network that only requires the, the pre-collision state. And here you can see, for instance, we can now solve zillions of agents, but they are also, for instance, 30 dimensional agents. So you're rethinking now about financial market portfolios or, or parameters in a neural network. Uh, so that this is very, every agent itself is, is very, very, very high dimensional. Uh, last but not least, this is a bit different. Um, of course, the, the last level that is missing here is what can we do at the mean field level? So we have seen how to do control synthesis for agent-based model at a microscopic scale. Now, briefly, we discuss how to wrap this into a neural network that would allow you to solve uh, kinetic equations. And the last part that is missing here is uh, what can we do at the mean field level? What can we do in terms of mean field control, not in terms of Pontrian conditions, but really feedback control, uh, mean field control of the Fogel-Planck equation. So here again, the motivation would be if we have agent-based models of this type that would naturally tend to cluster, you have the microscopic dynamics, uh, the microscopic dynamics leads to a non-local transport, uh, sort of a Mikein vlasov equation here. Um, and uh, here, what is interesting is uh, we're interested here in con um, stabilization towards steady states here. So basically what happens for an equation of this type, if you really think about Hexelman, uh, Krause type uh, opinion dynamics models, is that when the diffusion, uh, diffusion coefficient is very low, uh, what you have is that the uh, clustering is the uh, stable steady state. Uh, if the if the if it's too hot, then the uniform um, the uniform density becomes the stable equilibrium, and we would like to play around with this. Uh, so at some point, uh, we would like, for instance, instead of controlling towards a, a single opinion, we want to disorganize the system. We want to avoid clustering. I would like to uh, control towards the uniform density with uh, with, for instance, if there is uh, no much diffusion. Uh, this would be an unstable steady state. So I think this is a nice illustration because really in terms of opinion, you can think about clustering and, and uniform um, steady states and where they are stable or not uh, and, and, and reverse this behavior through the action uh, of an external control. Um, this led us to a rabbit hole on computing um, steady states of the Fogel-Planck equation, first of all, uh, without control. So you may think uh, for this Fogel Planck equation, if you give me V uh, and you give me the non-local uh, interaction potential, uh, this may have, in this case, it has a periodic boundary conditions or a setting uh, where you may have uh, many steady states, hmm? uh, uh, both stable and unstable. Uh, for the stable ones, the computation can be done directly just by simulating uh, the long-term evolution of the PDE. Uh, but if you think about the unstable steady states, how do you find them? Well, uh, from a numerical analysis viewpoint, you would need really to solve the steady state uh, PD. Mm -hmm. 
and see what solutions come after that. Uh, but of course, uh, numerically, this is interesting because now that you know that this uh, PDE has many steady states, uh, you would like to find all of them. Hmm? Uh, and that we have done it with uh, what we, it's called a deflation approach uh, that's been around for almost a decade, uh, which is just this, this idea, imagine that the right-hand side is a polynomial that has many roots. Uh, every time that, so you would solve a Newton method for this, for the steady state. Every time that you find a solution, uh, you find a root of the system, you divide the right-hand side by that root, and then you recast a Newton method for the modified system. So you are placing poles in all the solutions that you are finding, and that somehow will deviate your Newton iteration to find new solutions uh, of this equation. It's a, it's a very, very elegant idea. I like it very much. Of course, it's not my idea. It's, it's, uh, it's colleagues, but in particular, Patrick Farrell has been uh, developing computational solvers uh, for deflation, for finding solutions of nonlinear PDEs of all sorts. They have beautiful papers where some mathematical physics PDEs for people know for for all sorts of reasons that, for instance, you have nine solutions, they are able to find uh, all the nine solutions with all uh, with this sort of uh, Newton uh, Newton iteration that is deflated with the solutions that you are finding along the way. But going back to my example here, really in this case, I don't have that many solutions, but I would like to find them all stable and unstable solutions. Everything that makes zero the right hand uh, right hand side, and actually. Uh, one nice result that Sarah, my, my, my student, has found along the way is that actually she has been able to find uh, quite a few unstable solutions to these. So the, the stable solutions are known and they are consistent. We also regard them by long-term evolution. Uh, but there are a few, all the few things that would kill the right-hand side of this PDE so that they are unstable, uh, unstable steady states uh, if you give this sort of opinion dynamic type, uh, uh, type kernels. Where we find different solutions, and, and for instance, here you can see how the as the as diffusion um, increases, how the steady state it moves from clustering towards a, a the stable one towards a uniform solution. But then you also can then the the clustering becomes a it becomes unstable steady states, and we're able to find different clustering uh, that is in fact. That are in fact unstable steady states of the of the right hand side, uh, but for course from from a control perspective here, uh, what we're interested in is controlling uh, towards uh, unstable solutions. So now that after that we have found the the unstable steady states, we want to have a feedback uh, a feedback load that regulates towards the unstable states, and this is easier said than done because um, now. Um, this is a non-trivial business of steering dynamics towards an unstable equilibrium. Uh, this is a bit different from what people do in the literature because uh, the, the natural problem for Fogger-Planck equation is that you will have a stable steady state uh, and you just want to accelerate conversions towards this equilibrium. Mm -hmm. So, But if you don't touch the system, it will eventually go to the steady state. So that's it. And then you just think about controls that can accelerate uh, this. This is slightly different because controlling towards an unstable state uh, requires a permanent action. You cannot just do your optimal trajectory and then shut off the control and go to sleep. You really have to uh, hit exactly the, the unstable state and being always with a control that somehow is regulating you back, uh, back there. Mm -hmm. We do this with model predictive control, which is the nicest way to recycle Pontryagin conditions into a... a um, into feedback control. So we do, at, at all times, we're solving an optimal control problem that starts from the current time in a time horizon and tries to approach uh, the unstable steady state. And, and this is what you can see, for instance, here, we start from, from a certain uh, disorganized state and we really want to stabilize the density uh, towards the uniform state. Um, um, and you can see here in this plot, uh, if you weren't to do any control, of course, the dynamics themselves, they, they depart from the unstable state and they converge to the, to the steady state, to the stable one. Uh, that's what I will do if, if you don't touch it. But here, this red dot, you will see, this is just 
they receive all towards the unstable steady state. So we're effectively uh, steering the dynamics, controlling the dynamics towards the, the unstable solution. And you can also think about the other regime. So now you can think about somehow the cold situation where cluster, sorry, the warm situation where clustering becomes the, the unstable uh, steady state and the uniform distribution will be the stable. So you start from, from, from a disorganized state and again, are effectively able to, to control the density towards the clustering that is a steady state solution of this system, but on top of it is an unstable a unstable steady state. And this is again, the red dot, the red line there, the blue line is what would happen if you don't touch the, if you don't touch the system, you go to the stable solution. Um, so just to wrap up, I think I'm, I'm very unusually well on time. Um, computing first message here. I, I don't know if this message is really interesting to you. I hope it is, but uh, but I always tell this because sometimes we always read that the feedback controls are difficult. We cannot compute them, blah, blah, blah. I really would like to make the point that at least from a computational viewpoint, and also there is some theory bagging all this that I'm, that I'm, that I'm showing. Uh, computing high dimensional optimal feedback loss is really feasible. I mean, say in January, 2024, I don't think this is really an open problem. I think that uh, if people need to compute optimal controls, optimal feedback loss for microscopic agent-based dynamics, for drones, uh, for particles of all kind, uh, we can do it. And we can do it up to a very high accuracy in high dimensional spaces. Uh, there is a very well understood theory, hamilton jacobi theory about nonlinear stabilization. And we do have rigorous uh, numerical methods that can deliver up to, as I say, 200, 500 dimensional uh, states. Um, the basis of these schemes are, of course, not solving the PD stealth, but using data that comes from, from hardcore optimal control theory that uh, between the uh, discussing the link between hamilton jago equation and uh, Pontryagin conditions. That is something very interesting, in my opinion, because uh, this theory has been developed for all different reasons over the last 50 years. Uh, and at some points, a bit obscure, but now we're really seeing links, how to exploit these links between Pontryagin conditions and the hamilton jaco equations for a computational purpose, not just a theoretical purpose, but really as a theory that enables uh, the solution of very interesting deep learning type uh, uh, problems. Mm -hmm. uh, again, uh, collective dynamics also at the genetic level can be solved by wrapping this into neural networks and, and, and doing these very fast calls where you can sample binary interactions, post-collision states without having to solve uh, optimal control problems uh, online. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I was showing at the beginning, now we're super excited about this control of unstable steady states of the of the fogger planck equation. Uh, but going back to my first slide with Stroga's uh, taxonomy, from now that the, at the BD level fogger planck equation, uh, there's still some very classical problems that remain open, for instance, feedback control of uh, uh, turbulence. Um, is something that we have been working with Lucas Saluzzi. These plots, for instance, are from feedback control of the Navier-Stokes equation, a, a quintessential problem uh, in, say, computational math. Uh, uh, but uh, we're able to have very, but still, it's still open. Still, these are higher dimensional state state uh, spa, uh, state spaces because here the state space is really the discretization. It's an infinite dimensional uh, dynamical system or a very 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 high dimensional dynamical system where we're trying to go. Uh, to control. Of course, there are some references for all these solvers, but of course, if you have any questions, just let me know. I'm, I'm happy to, to explain and or to get in touch or to hand in a code uh, that can actually allow you to compute uh, feedback loss for either high dimensional microscopic systems or for the kinetic equation or for the uh, fogger planck uh, equation. Uh, I'll stop here, uh, but I hope you ask questions. Uh, but I don't like when I don't have any questions at the end of the talk. So if you don't have any question, I probably will go about uh, answering uh, some of these questions that I have here in this list uh, that I think personally that are interesting, or maybe some of this is appealing to you and would like to know the answer. So yes, uh, thanks for your time. Again, I'm sorry I couldn't be there, but uh, I hope it was not too terrible. And yes, please uh, ask me any questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So I redirect.
this directly to the audience. Are there questions here? Dante, thanks for the nice talk. Um, Oliver here. Yeah, hi Oliver. Yeah. Uh, I have a question about part one. So when you do this learning procedure, so I'm I'm guessing this uh, uh oh, you're going back there. Right, the value function is a function essentially. I mean, if uh, on X, but I guess if if X is kind of a system of particles describing a system of particles, and they are usually indistinguishable, then in fact my I expect my value function to be uh somehow symmetric under so invariant under permutation in some sense. Is is there a way to learn something like this? So now you're in kind of a quotient space, and then you want to look for functions that are. Yeah, actually, that's an excellent point because we we exploit this with Diago. Perhaps you can talk to him. We can exp we we naturally exploit this here, no? So, for instance, the genetic layer when we have two particles, we say, well, a u is a function of x and y or v w, and it doesn't matter. It really commutes these two things, right? Because the system is is it really exploits this symmetry, okay? But I'm afraid that the way that we're doing here, this where I'm a bit of an idiot here and we're doing it brute force. So this system is really numbered from one to 200 without making any distinction on what mm -hmm. you are saying. Yeah. Uh, I would need to think whether you are able, you are allowed to make any simplification because uh, you are glo solving globally in space, no? So still, um, Somehow this is also embedded when you do mean field modeling and then your feedback becomes a feedback from your particle, comma, the density of everybody else, right? Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's actually it's a very good question. But uh, yeah, I haven't thought about it and how to exploit it. I'm, I'm, I'm just here working with this system, assuming that the particles are different, but it's true that in practice, uh, they are not, yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks, Nathan. Yeah, okay. Okay, more questions, yes. Hi, Dante. Thank you for this uh, talk. I'm sorry, my question is not very, uh, <laughs> uh, not very uh, nice because it's already on your last slide. But I would be personally interested in this pin approach because um, I would say that uh, I mean, you learned somehow uh, now an approximation. But why didn't you start already with a pin to get somehow the full uh, value function uh, as a parameterized? Is there some reason why you use the different neural network to do that? Uh, okay, so. Uh, pin means I actually um okay pin would mean that my loss function is the residual of the BD here right so I would have data plus I mean if 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 you would truly buy the whole pin business I would have my loss function which is matching the data plus a match a minimizing the residual of the BD mm -hmm. and for that uh, the problem here there are two. Uh, there are a few issues. First of all, um, this is a high-dimensional PD, so this norm, this residual here, is an L2 norm in a very high-dimensional space. And it, it, what is very unclear in the literature is how would you go about sampling in every iteration of stochastic gradient descent this very high-dimensional uh, L2 norm? Hmm? Uh, it's, it's going to be very, very, very expensive. Yeah? Um, one problem here is that if you don't incorporate data. But I do, it's not really a problem. But one feature is that if you don't incorporate data in your loss function and you only rely on the minimization of the receivable, well, this is a tricky issue in the hamilton jago equation because hamilton jago equations, they, don't, they do not necessarily have a unique solution in, in that, in that receivable. So you might find many, a lot of garbage that minimizes the receivable of the hamilton jago equation, but it's actually not the value function. Of the of the control problem that you're looking for. So, for instance, here I have a very simple two-dimensional problem, where the classical sort of Rigatti problem, where uh, you would have four solutions to the hamilton yago equation. They are one one the value function, the other one is minus the value function, and then you have two saddle points. And if you just go through the pin approach, you have no guarantee that you're going to converge to the right value function. You're just converging to one of the other, depending on where you initialize your solver. So um, there are two issues. Well, one is how do you sample this very high dimensional residual? Second issue is how do you ensure that the pin actually leads you to the solution of the PD? In this case, I'm using I'm exploiting some control theory that actually tells that my data that I'm doing is actually linked to the right solution of the hamilton jacob equation. So by doing supervised learning, I'm recovering this, this object. But yeah, I think I think it's an open problem. I don't have any 
prejudice against this, this is an alternative, but one would have to be careful about these two things. In particular, what I've tried in high dimensional spaces and we really struggle is how do you sample this high dimensional residual? And, and you will find that unfortunately, many of the BIM papers, they go about solving PDs in low dimensional spaces for which we already have good finite element solvers. So and, and this is a bit... The other people what tell you is that Okay, one option would be to localize the solution. So you are not really sampling these huge L2 spaces. You are just going somewhere either lower dimensional or, or somewhere locally, but then you lose all the appeal of the hamilton yago equation, which is that it gives you a globally fine uh, feedback law. Yeah, that's it. Okay. He, he looks very satisfied with this answer. So. Uh, yeah, it does it. <laughs> no, no, he, he is. He is. So uh, <laughs> we thank Dante again, and um, he's not around in the coffee break, but I'm I'm sure he's yeah. happy if you drop him an email for further questions. Yeah, I have email. You can write it. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay, see you soon yeah. in person. Yeah, thank you, you again. Bye bye. <laughs> bye, guys. Bye, bye. All right. So our next speaker is Elisa Iacomini from Ferrara speaking about traffic flow models with uncertainties. Please. So thanks a lot for the nice introduction. And I would like to thank the organizer for the very kind invitation and for giving me the opportunity to talk and present my uh, recent results in uh, traffic flow models. As you can see from the title, I would deal with traffic flow models with uncertainty. And what I would do is to give you an overview of what has been done and also so my results and also some uh, work in progress. So the uh, outlook of today, uh, I will start giving you like the framework in which I'm working and the motivation of our study. Then I would introduce the uncertainty and to deal with uncertainty, we will uh, follow two different approaches. One is the stochastic galerking approach and I will give you uh, in a moment some details on the approach and how we use it. And then uh, I will also talk about multifidelity approach, which is another class of uh, methods. So, and I will also give you some details, but this is still a work in progress. So I already say, and then I will uh, conclude with some remarks and some future perspectives for what's happening next. So the framework I'm working is the following. I'm dealing with the mathematical mo modeling of traffic flow. And as you all may know, this can be done at uh, different scales, both spatial and temporal. It depends on what we want to model. So we can start from a very detailed description as you see in this picture, and we, uh, where we track each single vehicle like an agent. And so we can describe the velocity and the position and so also recover the trajectory of the agent itself. But then we can also consider aggregate uh, quantities, uh, as you might see here. So you zoom out and what you have is a macroscopic description, which mathematically is, uh, yeah, uh, is modeled by some conservation laws. And this we'll, we'll also see in a moment. And between the two scales, so from the micro, so from the agent-based model and the microscopic, there is also the mesoscopic scale, which is um, coming from gas kinetic. And this is a scale that provides a statistical description of, uh, of the car. So actually we have uh, the description of the interactions between the cars, but we also have an aggregate point of view on, on the same problem. So this is the framework and what I would do is to introduce the uncertainty at each scale. And then we will also exploit the links and the connection between the scales to get information in the level that we want to study. So in the last 50 years, there, will be, there was a huge literature and a lot of, really a lot of new models came out to model traffic flow that could be the from the easier ones to the most complicated ones, but there is still some limitations to obtain reliable traffic forecast. And for this, we can address this to two main problems. One is that the dynamic is really high, highly nonlinear. So this is a problem that affects the modeling itself, but also we need to consider that traffic is uh, affected by several so sources of uncertainties. And this, uh, might be because if we have data and we deal with data, then of course we all know that data can be affected by some noise. So when we consider 
and for example, also the initial condition that we see, okay, on this we are safe, actually is not completely true. If the data are coming from sensors, because the sensor is taking measurements, and these measurements can be affected by noise. And also, we need to deal with the fact that traffic is also considered like a human behavior, such that, uh, so we have the reaction time of the agents, so of the driver itself, and on the cars, and so all these for example, the reaction time of drivers it can be different from one agent to the other, from one car to the other, and then we have trucks, and then we have different weather conditions. So all these can also be considered as uncertainty. And so what we want to do here is to uh, deal with, so we will deal with this part. So we will consider traffic models with the uncertainty that will collect somehow all of these uh, possible sources. And to do this, we have several approaches. Uh, the main, uh, so we can divide these um, approaches in two main classes. One is the intrusive uh, class or the intrusive methods. These are a class in which the main idea is to reformulate the problem. And we need to solve just once, but a big system of deterministic equation. And an example of this class is a stochastic alerting method that I will explain you in the next slide. On the other side, we have also non-intrusive methods, of course. And the main example, if you want to get an idea of this class, is the Monte Carlo uh, method that you may all know. So we have a fixed number of samples. And for each sample, we perform a deterministic uh, algorithm. And so this is the other class that I will uh, discuss uh, in the second part of the talk. So the stochastic alerting approach, as I told you, is an intrusive method. So we collect, and then we describe with psi the uncertainty. And so uh, this uncertainty belongs, so we put the uncertainty inside the, the uh, traffic model itself. So if we are dealing with a, a variable u, for example, that depends on time and space, then it also depends on the uncertainty. Xi. So for example, if we have a conservation law, then the Xi is part of the problem itself. And to solve these kind of problems, uh, we need to recall the notion of generalized polynomial Scouts expansion. So we have a probability space omega, and we discretize the probability space. And um, we represent the stochastic quantities by infinite series expansions. And to do this, we need uh, a basis function, uh, basis functions for, for this space. And we choose uh, orthonormal polynomials, which are orthonormal to the inner product here. And so we have that our uh, variable u, we describe it as this infinite sum, where we have u hat, which is the coefficient that note that this depends on time and space. And that's it. And then we have phi xi, that is uh, the basis function. So we kind of can split what depends on the uncertainty and what is instead deterministic. And these coefficients are just computed by this uh, L2 product. And so, which is the main important thing here to remember is that we can express the mean and the variance of this uh, variable here, just looking at the coefficients. So we don't have to compute anything else if we have the, our uh, quantity expressed like this, we, if we look at the first coefficient, with, which is u0 hat, then we can, so this is exactly the mean value. While if we consider the sum of the square of all the others, then we get the variance, okay? So this is our framework, which is the idea. So of course, we can't deal with infinite sums because we also want to do some numerics. So this is impossible for us. So we expand the stochastic quantities in, in truncated series. So we truncate at a capital K here. And so this is what we have. And then we project. So first of all, since we truncate, we need to be sure that uh, our expansion converges to what I showed the slide before. And this is, uh, done and is proved in this paper from uh, Cameron and Martin. So on this side, we are safe. And the idea now is to substitute this. Uh, so the 
uh, expansion inside the equation itself of the model. And then uh, we project on the space and this lead to a deterministic system for the coefficients. So because why we have this is deterministic system? Because when we project, we have something like this. So we have our expansion that we project and then due to the orthogonality of the basis function, we just get an equation for the coefficient. This means that the dimension is, is growing because then we have an equation for each coefficient. Okay, so this was the framework for the intrusive method. So for the stochastic Galerkin, we keep it in mind. And now let's see how this will uh, affect or how we can study through the scales in the, of, the mathema of uh, the traffic models. So of course we start from the easy one. So we start from the microscopic one. So we have N cars uh, with Xi, Vi and Ai. We identify the position, the velocity and the acceleration of the car I at time T. Of course, it's very important that these cars are uh, sorted and they cannot overtake. And so this is uh, the typical follow the leader model that in formulas reads like this, we can have first order models and second order models. The difference is that in the first order model, we have that the, uh, the velocity, so an equation for the velocity here, but the velocity is a given function, which depends on the difference between the positions of the cars. And then the second order model, of course, we have also an equation for the uh, acceleration term. So this is the deterministic one. If we put the uncertainty, uh, the first question is, where do we put the uncertainty? So as I told you before, let's still keep the easy uh, problem. Let's say that the uncertainty is in the initial data. So we, have, we assume that our data are affected by noise so that the, we have problems estimating the difference between two cars because that may be come from these sensors that the uh, vehicle has now. So here we have our uncertainty and this is how it reads our uh, position xi that depends on xi because then if it's like here, the uncertainty, then it affects each time, future time steps. So this is how it reads the stochastic follow the leader model for me. And if we project and we do what I said before, we have this system which is not anymore n equation, but is n times k plus one equation. So the, the dimensionality of this system is growing. And yeah, so that is for the first order model. If we want to see what happened to the second order model, this is just the expression, uh, just doing the projection. The important thing is to note that this system now has two n times k plus one equation. So this, Capital K is really important if we uh, say, so if we have a high number of K, then this system has really a lot of equation that might be very difficult to solve. And of course, at each iteration, we need to re recompute all the projections. So on this side, we need to be careful, of course, can be done and doesn't have too many difficulties from the mathematical point of view, but from the numeric, Yes, so sometimes if the number are very high and also if the number of cars is very high, then I would prefer to go to another scale. And for this reason, we can also consider kinetic traffic flow models. So here V is the velocity as before, uh, G is the mass distribution function. Then Q models the cars to cars interaction. And uh, yeah, we have a BGK type model in which epsilon is the relaxation rate towards the equilibrium because here what we consider q is a linear uh, operator of bgk type where we have a relaxation towards a known equilibrium which is this m which is also called maxwellian so this is the kinetic model that we consider here and of course we are interested if we have uh, the um, uncertainty inside and here it's how it reads the stochastic uh, kinetic model. And of course, we want to do the projection. And yet, yet we are able to write the stochastic Galerkin formulation for the kinetic model. 
And of course, I mean, I know that some of these terms are really ugly, but uh, yeah, it's still solvable. So we can compute these uh, integrals also numerically. So this can be done. Okay, then we go, okay, we did micro, we did meso, and that, let's see what happened to the macroscopic scale. At the macroscopic scale, we see, of course, aggregate quantity. So I have to introduce rho, which is the density of cars. V is still the velocity, and F is the flux. The first order model is just, so the typical LWR model from Lytle, Wigan, Richards. And it's uh, an hyperbolic conservation law, one dimension. So we don't have too many problems. Of course, we have to assume this uh, capital V a Q is a given um, velocity or equilibrium velocity. And usually it's chosen like one minus rho. And of course, if here we introduce the uncertainty still in the initial uh, data, and then it's of course uh, affecting the whole system, we do the spectral expansion. And here we don't have problems. So we just have a K plus one, um, Oh, so a system with k plus one equations where we need just to be careful that we choose a consistent GPC expansion of this function here. So for example, if we chose uh, one minus rho, then the uh, GPC expansion reads like this because it's linear, so everything is easy. But of course, life cannot be always so easy. So let's see where where is the trap. So, uh, then we go to the second order model because I told you that we want to be the more accurate as possible with the model. So of course, second order models describe a more rich uh, dynamics. So let's see what happens. The most famous one in the traffic community is the oraskol zang model that reads like this. We have an equation for the momentum. So we can also rewrite this system in a conservative form so that looks nicer. And so, what, so what's new from before, we have a second equation here. So we have a system of conservation laws. And this we'll see in the next slide will create lots of problems. Because, so now we have this uh, system. So this system is strictly hyperbolic if we assume that we are far from the vacuum state. And this is assumption that, okay, we can make it. And yeah, so, no, so if we go from, uh, so this tau is the reaction time. And yeah, so this looks nice, but what happens? Okay, we want, now we are familiar with the procedure. What we want to do is what we did so far to substitute the truncated expansion and to project inside the system. But now we have a system. We don't have a conservation in one, uh, conservation law in one dimension anymore. And what happens here is that if we do what we did so far, we lose the hyperbolicity. And this is, a, so in this framework is a huge problem. So this is something that we really don't want. So all our efforts were, okay, can we do something to preserve the hyperbolicity? Can we do something not to lose this very nice property? After some work and some time, the answer is yes, we can do it. And okay, to solve the problem, we need to be um, a little more precise because so far I didn't give you any uh, assumption or any hypothesis on the basis function or on the distribution of the, the uncertainty. So now, uh, if you want to recover the hyperbolicity, and here I put the, how it's written the system, the GPC system, so the Galerkin, stochastic Galerkin formulation for the oraskol zang model, we need to do some technical assumption on the basis functions, okay? So we are not free anymore to choose the basis functions that we want. And then, okay, we make a change of variables. And what is also nice that I will show you very so soon is that we can derive the macroscopic uh, formulation from the approximation we, we can do with the kinetic model. So this system now is, uh, strictly, so it's hyperbolic and this is what we want to do. But from, from here to here, there was a lot of work to do. So just to be clear. So, okay, now that we, okay, we have these three class of models, so the micro, the kinetic and the macro, 
what we want to do now, it's like, okay, do we have some connections between the scales? Because in the, in the deterministic case, this is natural. We, we start from the micro, we go to the uh, kinetic, and we can also go to the uh, macroscopic scale. What right to do in this framework was to find if there was kind of connection that we can exploit, not to put so many uh, requirements at the beginning. So if you want to go from the micro directly to the macroscopic one, what we can prove is that the system written like this, so not the stochastic Galerkin formulation, but just the stochastic ODE system converge to the stochastic LWR model if we are in the first, uh, first order case. And of course, if the size of the cars goes to zero and if the number of cars goes to infinity, and this can also be done for the second order model, but we so far, so if you have ideas, okay, but so far we, uh, so I couldn't prove anything on any connection on the stochastic Galerkin coefficients. But this is something that we can do if we consider the kinetic, from the kinetic model to the macroscopic model, if we have a solution for the kinetic model in terms of the coefficient and we choose like our initial coefficient for the density as it should be, so like the integral of the distribution and uh, the momentum in this way, then uh, we know that, okay, we still need some technical assumptions, mainly on the basis functions and some, uh, yeah, the consistent GPC uh, formulation for the, um, yeah, for the velocity and so on. But this formally fulfill point-wise the oraskol zhang formulation. So we can actually, if we know these terms, we can actually know which is the coefficient at the macroscopic level. Okay, and of course this system was hyperbolic because this is exactly what was in the slide before, okay. Okay, so now we are here. We want to, okay, now we have these tools. Can we do something more? Because, so the, the answer is yes, uh, but because we want to have some other insights on the, on the model. So we have a powerful tool now because we can actually study the uncertainty inside the model. So how this propagates, so how the uncertainty that we have in the input can propagate and affect the output. So this is an information that we want to use. And what, what do we want to do? Usually when we have a traffic, we want to model traffic flow. We want to know if, okay, there, if we start from this scenario, can we have like a congested way, a congested zone or um, some instabilities in the, in the density, in the traffic behavior. So we wanted the tool to investigate the, this possibly high risk zone for traffic. And what we did, we started from this, uh, from the kinetic model we assume that this uh, epsilon is small but positive, so it's not going to zero. We perform a, a first order chapman Enskog approximation of this term. We substitute, we made lots of computation, and what we uh, obtain at the end is an advection diffusion equation that reads like this. I drop all the dependencies because if not, it wouldn't fit in the slide, but remember that rho depends on psi. And so we have this diffusion coefficient here that we know from uh, the paper by Herti, Pupo, Roncoroni, and Visconti that if this term is positive, then uh, we have a stable regime. So what we want to do is to study the probability to have instability. So which is the probability to have that this coefficient is uh, less or equal than zero? Okay, and this is how the coefficient reads. I know that it's awful, but yeah, um, we can, so it's still doable. Even if it doesn't look so nice, it's possible to implement it. So let's say some numerical uh, details. So we choose uh, Xi as a uniform distributed random variable. The, the basis function that we chose are the higher basis function, and they are kind of step functions, okay? Uh, so then we, fulfill the CFL condition and for the um, or PDE, we use a lux Friedrich scheme, just details. And of course, as the equilibrium velocity is uh, one minus rho. And so the first thing I wanted to do 
in the traffic flow, one of the main uh, feature is the fundamental diagram, which means that we study the density with respect to the flux. And what I wanted to do is to see if this uncertainty can let us recover something that we see from the data. So here I plot the mean of, uh, of the de so density and flux. And um, this I did with the LWR model. So first order model is able to actually uh, represent a scattered fundamental diagram, because this is something that you really see uh, if you just plot the data that you get from the sensors. And what is very interesting to note is that here we have this free flow region, so everything seems fine. Here it's a congested area, and it's also reasonable that there is not so many choices for the flux because, I mean, the cars are almost, the density is almost one, so which means that the cars are almost uh, one bump to bump to each other, so they can't move. But if we are here, this we see uh, a, a cloud of points. So at the same uh, density might correspond different values of the velocity because the flux is given by the density times the velocity. So, and this is very important that with the first order model, we are able to reproduce something like this. And if we want to see and to be even more precise, and we also take into account the variance because I said it's for free. We just need to sum up the square of the other coefficients. And okay, I plot it just from 0 0.5 on because if not, it was very difficult to see the picture. But also here, there is something as we might see here. So what is important from this picture is that we see in this region that if we have a small variation and so the, the uh, variance of the uh, density is small, we have a big variance in the flux, which means that the velocity is, so the variance of the velocity is higher. What, that is exactly the opposite of what happens here, that we have uh, a large vari uh, so variance in the, in the density. It corresponds to a very small variance in the flux. And this is something that is reasonable, and we were happy with these results. And OK. Let's see uh, something a little more mathematical. So if we start with a rarefaction wave, uh, this is um, the solution at the final time. And we wanted to investigate the numerical convergence to work K. This is just numerical study. We see that K is the term of the truncation. OK, if we have this sum and we truncated the term K, we have that here the mean with increasing number of K, we kind of go so the variation between them is not too high anymore and this is the same for, for the variance what is interesting as i told you before the application was to study the probability of this term to be uh, not positive and here what we see uh, is a sna pre snapshots actually because we have uh, the probability of instabilities at time t zero uh, final time and the intermediate time and we see that all, if a time zero is the black line the probability is slightly more than 0 0.6. We can already say that at the final time, it will be a 0 0.8 probability of uh, instabilities. And this so this instability region or probability of instability region travels backward. And why this? This can be explained by this other plot in which we have the solution at the final time. So. The uh, gray area is the confidence region of the density, and the blue is the uh, probability. And we see that here is the region in which the density starts to decrease, which means that the vehicles are encouraged to go faster, or they are allowed to accelerate a little. And since, um, yeah, this is the area where instabilities can be created, something like uh, so accident, but yeah, also like stop and go waves can be the way, the case. And so some traffic instabilities may occur here much more than here, where the traffic seems to be more stable because uh, here everyone somehow knows uh, what to do. Okay. And this was the first part of the talk. But yeah, of course, uh, we made some assumptions that we are not sure if we can fulfill. It depends on the problem that we want to solve. So for example, the distribution of the uncertainty might be unknown. 
So for the stochastic Galerkin formulation, we assume that we know it, but yeah, who told us? And actually that was a real problem because at some point I wanted to study, like not just picking a uniform distributed uh, distribution, but it's okay. Uh, in a company, uh, we were uh, collaborating with uh, Autovia Venete, and then I, I called them and say, okay, uh, you gave us the data, but can you also have some information on the sensors itself? And I said, of course not, because it was like conflict of interest with the company that provides the sensors. So, okay, then we need to change somehow the how to study the problem. So, of course, so the distribution on the uncertainty can be unknown, or we can also have a lack of regularity, okay? Or also the distribution of the uncertainty, since I said that I need special basis function, they might not uh, fulfill the requirements to get their turbolicity back. So I don't want to drop the whole class of second order macroscopic systems. And then also we want maybe to study different kind of, uh, of uncertainties that maybe are not in the initial data, but might be in the reaction term or in the interactions between the cars. So I want to be more flexible as I can without changing the whole system. So we said, okay, maybe why don't we try to use the non-intrusive approach? And this, as I told you before, the main, uh, yeah, we can uh, think about them as Monte Carlo uh, methods. And of course, all of you know that if we deal with Monte Carlo, one of the main, uh, Drawback is that the convergence is not that fast. Okay, so we are strict to this estimate. And so now we have to, so we can do too much. The only thing we can do is to try to find ways, at least one of the ways to solve this problem is to reduce the variance here. And so what we are trying to do, and this is a work in progress for me, uh, we have, uh, we, so I look back at the, uh, literature and they found this paper from uh, Di Marco and Pareskin of uh, multi-scale controlled variate methods for uncertainty. So I said, okay, let's try this in this setting. So the idea is to reduce the variance that we have here. So to improve the convergence, exploiting the knowledge of so that we have. So the existing hierarchy that we have between the scales. And this is uh, like the goal. Okay, that it's far in the future for now. So this is the idea. We want to reduce the variance using what we already know. And of course, since the method is called multi-fidelity, we expect that we have more than one uh, model. So we have high fidelity model and low fidelity model. A high fidelity model, what is that for us? It's something, so it's a model that we want to use to achieve a certain accuracy. But of course, when we want to be precise, the price to pay is that they are very expensive. And so also we don't want to spend too much time on that. And, and so for example, we can think about a kinetic model. They are very expensive to solve. And then we say, okay, who is the low fidelity model? It's something that is very cheap to compute, but of course might not be reached the accuracy that we wanted. If not, why just don't use the low fidelity? And the key point is that the low fidelity approximate the high fidelity model, okay? We kind of, our model, we consider, so okay, this is very hard to solve or very expensive. So we use a surrogate, so like um, a low fidelity, so this, this one. And for example, we can think about the first order macroscopic model that is not super accurate, but it's very cheap. So it's useful to get an insight. And so the idea is that with a few evaluation of the high fidelity model and many more of the low fidelity, we put them together and then we can improve the accuracy if we stay with the same computational cost. Or if we want to reduce the computational cost, we can achieve the accuracy that we require here with a few, uh, with, with a less computational cost. Okay, so just to fix the ideas, I give you an example let's say the kinetic case, because it's the perfect framework for this, and in a space homogeneous setting. So we keep it the easiest as we can. So the high fidelity model here is a Boltzmann type kinetic equation. 
of course, with uncertainty. And as a model, I take a model which was introduced by Tosin and Zanella in this paper. So this is the interaction rules, and the uncertainty is in the interaction term, so here. And uh, OK, we do, uh, as was done in the paper, we recover the Boltzmann equation, and f is the distribution. And then this is the high fidelity, and as a low fidelity model, we can also use the known steady state that, of course, this is the formula that was proven in this, in this paper. OK, so the general idea for this kind of problems is that, OK, we start from the homogeneous uh, setting. We consider this the, uh, the composition, so the uh, distribution we want to solve as like the steady state plus a perturbation. And what we want to do, we see that if we write it like this, the interaction term with the two steady states is zero, and G has a special structure, so a special property that some of the moments are zero. So like the, we preserve the, the mass, the momentum, and the energy. So the integral of G is zero, the integral of uh, yeah, V times G is zero, and the integral of V squared divided by two times G is also zero. And then, um, there is a, a proposition still in this paper that tells us if we do this under suitable assumption, then the steady state here is also zero. So this is not affected by psi. So in such a way that we are able to uh, split the expectation value in this way. So the expectation value of f is given just by the sum of these two. So if we now want to study this term and OK, we want to study. Uh, we have m sample of g. What we want to do, OK, what we had before. So in the first slide, we had uh, so this, the first of the second part. We have this estimate somehow that the expectation value minus the expectation computed with the Monte Carlo meter, this uh, proportional of uh, the standard deviation of f uh, times yeah the square root of m. Uh, in the denominator, but now we just substitute this term with this guy, and we know that we have this term here, so that this we have uh, the standard deviation of g, and this is very important because we know that uh, the steady state is zero. So we know that if we go to infinity, so for larger time, then the variance of this term or the standard deviation also is going to zero. So we can reduce the variance, so we can speed up our uh, method. So that was the, the general idea. Uh, so let's write it more uh, in a different way. We have M samples of the high fidelity method here. And we write uh, this in this way. So we have uh, low fidelity. It's indicated by F tilde. And this uh, expected value is given by this. We define E lambda M, which is this term, we have the Monte Carlo estimator that it's exactly this one. So the sum of the um, realization divided by the number of the samples. Uh, so this we do for the high fidelity. Here we do for the low fidelity. But we chose the low fidelity in a clever way so that this can be or computed analytically or we have a very accurate approximation of this guy here. And this we identify like this. Of course, if lambda is 0, this term doesn't exist. And so we, uh, we recover the standard Monte Carlo equation, uh, estimator. OK, so this is our setting. And uh, so if we now say, yeah, does it really work? Because I mean, this could also be a fair question. The answer is yes. Why? Because if we consider this as a random variable, and it's just taken from here, and we, we see that if we compute the expected value of this f lambda, this coincides with the expected value of f, this one. If we take the Monte Carlo estimator of this guy, this is exactly the e lambda m that we define here. And if we take the variance of this term, of this one, then this is the uh, explicit formula for the variance of this uh, random variable. And then the idea, if you remember at the beginning, I said we want to reduce the variance. So why don't try to minimize this guy to do this? 
it's easy. It's like, yeah. So we differentiate this equation with respect to lambda and we put the derivative to, uh, yeah, to zero. So if the variance of the uh, low fidelity model is uh, different from zero, then we have this theorem proved still in the same paper by DiMarco and uh, Pareschi, where we can explicitly say who is the optimal lambda uh, that we need to put here. And then this lambda minimizes the variance and gives the value for the variance of f lambda star, which is like this one. And this is the correlation coefficient between the low fidelity and the high fidelity model. And what is very important to note is that this variance for time which goes to infinity goes to zero, OK? So it's decreasing. So this is something that we really like. And of course, for lambda star, for the time that goes to infinity, the lambda star tends to 1. OK, so uh, now this is a slide that you saw before. What I want to, see, to show you is that, OK, if we have this in mind, and we use as a low fidelity model the steady state. What we can say uh, numerically is the L2 error between the blue line, which is the Monte Carlo um, simulation, and the red one, which is the control variant. We can gain at least one order of magnitude with the same uh, computational cost. So just to sum up, because I guess I'm okay, close with the time deadline. So I presented you two different approaches. Uh, stochastic Galerkin approach and the multi-fidelity. What is bad and what is uh, good of both? Because we cannot say that one is like perfect and the other one uh, is not so good. So uh, let's do it properly. So the stochastic Galerkin approach could be numerically cheap because if we can, so due to some restrictions on the basis function, we can compute offline all the products between the basis functions and the and so then we just need to update the coefficient without redoing the projection each time. And then we have a very easy uh, knowledge about the uh, expected value and the variance because we just read the coefficient. But of course, as I said, we have uh, to preserve the hyperbolicity. We have to be restricted to particular GPC basis. And this is not so nice because at least in the traffic case, we uh, have a loss of the spectral convergence, which is one of the main reasons why one should use like stochastic alerting. And so, yeah, uh, we need the knowledge of the distribution. That is something that with data we might not have. And OK, these are the good and the bad things. For the multi-fidelity set, we don't ask for any previous knowledge about the regularity of the distribution. And so if we get from data, we can just use the sample, so without problems. And of course, it's a way more flexible to consider different kinds of uncertainties because we just, so we use, we put the uncertainty, we take the samples and we run the same exact procedure without any reformulation. But still, we need to compute the variance the, and the expected value at each time that maybe is not something that we want if we want to save all the iterations that maybe it's not com computationally uh, cheap. And so we still need to do some evaluations. OK, so to conclude, we introduced the uncertainty in traffic flow models to improve the forecast. And so and then we presented in a unified framework uh, the three main scales of observation, so the micro, the kinetic, and the macro. And of course, when it's possible, also the links between these scales that can lead to some further properties. And then we saw how to use the intrusive and the non-intrusive approach, and also some numerical simulations. So next, we have plenty of work to do. Uh, so first of all, uh, we want to extend the multi-fidelity to the non-homogeneous case and to the multi-scale setting, because this was the idea where we started from, but uh, yeah. We still, it's still a work in progress, so I don't have results on that. But the idea is to use the kinetic and the macroscopic scale because, uh, yeah, we don't know. So it depends on what we uh, consider. No one knows. So no one tells us who is the steady state. So how to use the low fidelity model. So, but if we have a macroscopic, like the LWR uh, model, for example, that is very, so 
it's easier and maybe we can also mix different scales. So this is still a work in progress. Another work in progress is that we can exploit the link between the microscopic and the macroscopic models to, recreate, to recover some properties at the macroscopic level, like some particle method that can give us information about the positivity and the hyperbolicity property at the macroscopic level. And then there are also some traffic models which uh, actually uh, deals with uh, non-local uh, terms because of course you are always able to see in front of you, but how far, we don't know. So the other uh, open point is how to study the uncertainty in the non-local case. These are the main references uh, related to this talk. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Before we start the discussion, I want to announce that um, the organizers um, will show us a short movie or presentation from the EMS. Uh, they contributed to the funding of this um, workshop, so we should all pay attention, please. So, and now, uh, questions for Elisa, please. Okay, I, I start with one. So, um, in the first part, you mentioned that to preserve the hyperbolicity, you need to um, adapt the basis function. Yes. So, is it a technical thing, or do you do you have any intuition what happens by changing these uh, basis functions? The thing is, for doing all the reformulation, you need to be able to, for this matrices because at the end you are um, dealing with matrices of the products between the the basis function because you need this product to project and then when you do this and you want to do some computation the nice property that you want to have is that these matrices commute so that you can exchange them and so this was one of so the, the main the main reason so what we need these matrices to commute and also if we have the product between the three basis functions, so that leads to a tensor, this also we want to commute. So this was really uh, technical for making, so during the proof, you really need to uh, put together some terms. And so you need this, the freedom to exchange these this matrices. So that is, yes, it's very technical. Okay, thank you. More questions? Yeah, there's one. So uh, thank you, Elisa. And for in, in the last part regarding the control variant method, essentially, essentially you use the Boltzmann yes. and the steady state of Fokker plan. Yes. Okay. But can you, I mean, interface, I mean, uh, use Boltzmann and the transient behavior of Fokker Planck for some other reduced complexity collision operator like BGK, for example, having the same steady state of Fokker Planck? Then at that point, you gain something or not? So you mean um, here the control variant is f infinity, right? Of Fokker of another. No, you, you can consider this one. Let's say when you have like this as f infinity, like low low fidelity model is your f infinity. Yeah. So then the, it, it depends also on epsilon on I mean on on the scaling of Fokker of uh, Boltzmann, right? Yeah. So the the thing is that what you really need is that this uh, low fidelity is related to the high fidelity. Like yeah, it's the steady state and they are correlated. Okay, so uh, it is my duty to give you a very brief presentation of the second major player of this conference. So it is the European Mathematical Society. So I was told by the administration that this should be a very short presentation, like at most five minutes and no knowledge is needed. So let's 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 check if this is true. Um, okay, so uh, the European Mathematical Society was founded in the 90s, so 1990. And let's say the uh, idea is that it has to support mathematics in Europe and let's say mathematicians that are based in Europe. So here you see you have three types of, of members. So there are individuals, institutes, departments, till, till to let's say national societies. Okay, so which are the main aims of the, of the EMS is, let's say, the support of mathematics in more or less any direction, I would say, so research-wise, but also uh, from the point of view of education 
and also some ethics should be uh, listed here. And okay, and of course also let's say mathematicians with difficulties and so on. So um, they do it through a number of committees that you can see listed here. So there are, for instance, you, you, women in mathematics, and here you see ethics committees and developing countries and so on. So also relations outside of Europe in general. Um, the activities that, activities that you can find. So uh, let's say what is maybe more important for us is here the meetings. So you go from the ECM that is, I guess, known by everyone. And then you have also participation, let's say, or uh, fundings for uh, schools and conferences. That is exactly what happened here. And let's say if you are interested and look for some funding, the application is actually very easy. And once you get the access to the funding, also dealing with the administration is very easy. So in case you're interested. In. Okay, so you have, of course, also the part of publishing and press. So we know that there are journals managed by the uh, by the, the EMS in general, and then, okay, EMS price and so on. Okay, so I think that actually this is more or less all. Uh, well, of course, you know, some <laughs> benefits about membership of the, of the EMS. Uh, so here you see, for instance, the, the membership is free for students for uh, three years, and then you have all of sort of discounts for what is related to uh, to the EMS. So, yeah, okay, European Congress and the press part. Okay, and I think that this is actually all. So if you want more information, of course, you see here uh, the website of the EMS. Okay, so thanks for your attention. And we can move. We can move to the coffee break and the poster session. And so, uh, yeah, right. Uh, for the poster session, so those are that are presenting posters. There are support supports uh, at the at the coffee break place, let's say. And you have to ask Marco Morandotti for magnets to to hang the the presentations. So the posters. Okay, I think we're close to a stationary state, so I'm happy to introduce probably the last speaker of today. I don't know if there will be a dinner speech. <laughs> so uh, please welcome Lorenzo. He has now two affiliations. I don't want to read them, so um, stage is yours. Um, have fun. Okay, so <clears throat> thanks, Claudia, and uh, thanks to the audience for the patience to wait until this late time so it's a great responsibility of course to give a talk before the the social dinner so i will try not to put you in a bad mood and uh, uh, i will give some kind of overview on some uh, recent ideas that uh, uh, some interesting research topic i think that we started to work on uh, which as you will see it's uh, it involves uh, of course uh, 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 multi-agent systems, uh, but uh, uh, in a sort of um, uh, artificial uh, artificial dynamic. So the idea, the main motivations are connected to um, high-dimensional non-convex optimization, which is which of course is a field which is transversal to many uh, cutting-edge areas. Uh, of course, the um, nowadays very popular uh, these kind of things related to uh, machine learning, uh, but uh, even in uh, signal or image processing or optimal control problem, you may have to uh, deal with uh, uh, the optimization of a high dimensional problem. Um, of course, the problem becomes challenging as the, the, the manifold is non-convex uh, non uh, and eventually even more if you have uh, some uh, uh, non-smooth uh, uh, non functions. Uh, for this kind of problem, typically you can split, uh, let's say, the, the the approaches in two main families. Of course, there are many uh, many subfamilies, but let's say that one uh, um, division would be between uh, gradient-based and gradient-free algorithms. Uh, both methods, in any case, they use some uh, stochastic uh, aspect because uh, uh, you are thinking about uh, non uh, non-convex functions, so you need to find a way 
to escape from uh, uh, critical points, from local minima. Uh, stochastic gradient descent type method are very popular. Those are the, the method which are mostly, uh, I mean, say they are uh, used um, in, especially in the field of uh, uh, machine learning uh, for several reasons that I will not, not summarize uh, here. Uh, but on the other hand, there's a, another large family, uh, I would call it the kind of a zoo uh, of algorithms which uh, avoid the computation of the gradient and which essentially are usually referred to as uh, meta-heuristic or heuristic, which uh, gained a lot of popularity essentially due to the minimal assumption that you have to do on the optimization problem, even in terms of the fact the problem can be just discrete or can be formulated just uh, by uh, rules uh, and not necessarily by explicit function formulation. And this makes the, the, the method very uh, ex extremely flexible and they can be applied to a, a wider range of problem. Uh, so the idea of meta heuristic is that basically you uh, combine some uh, rule, heuristic rules, uh, with the idea that you want to provide the local uh, uh, or uh, improvements of your uh, uh, points typically in such a way that you try, as you see in the picture on the right, you try somehow to escape the local minima and to find the path towards the, the global, the global uh, uh, minimum. Um, here you see a list of some of the most famous uh, algorithms starting from uh, the celebrated uh, Metropolis Asting algorithm, which is at the basis of uh, uh, simulated annealing. And then you have many other, uh, let me say that probably the most popular are genetic algorithm, simulated annealing and uh, particle swarm optimization. For these three algorithms, the, the, the fact that they are very popular, they are already included in the MATLAB toolbox. In the global optimization toolbox, you are already this kind of algorithm included. So you can easily, you don't even need to implement it. You can just use the function if you want. And, uh, and uncolony optimization is another, is another algorithm which, is, uh, which gained a lot of popularity and uh, it's um, pretty well used in, in uh, some, uh, some communities. Uh, well, they have, a, as I was saying, uh, a significant empirical, empirical success, but uh, most of the results that you find in the literature, they are based on just on computer experiments and uh, definitely lack of a rigorous mathematical foundation in the sense that they are really derived by uh, a combi as a combination of empirical, of empirical rules. Uh, so how metaheuristic algorithms work? This is just to, to show you some video. Of course, uh, it depends on the algorithm itself, but the general philosophy is that uh, uh, you have some uh, collection of particles uh, and uh, you have to, you try to find the global minimum of a function. Here you have two classical prototype function, the Ackley and the Rastrigin. You see they both have many local minima. Of course, in the Ackley function, you see that the global minimum, you can catch it rather naturally, even uh, just uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, taking a look at the function. Whereas in Rastrigin, this is way more difficult because you have many local minima and more or less they all looks uh, the same. Here you see a sequence of snapshot of a swarm of uh, particle that moves trying to find the, the local minima in uh, this is the 2D Ackley function is exactly the one you see on the left. And you see how they orientate, uh, they communicate in some way, and then they are able in the end to find uh, the global minima. I'm going to show you some videos. Uh, this is a 1D uh, dynamic. Uh, Okay, let me. And you start from all particles concentrated on the right, then they start to move. Uh, as soon as the first particle is able to jump into, into the global minima, then attracts all the other, and eventually they all collapse into the <clears throat> global minima. But, uh, okay, this was... This is a 1D case. Uh, you can see a 2D uh, of uh, the challenge, the rust region function. This is similar to what uh, the, of the, the case of the snapshot that you have seen, but it's just, and you see how they communicate, they orientate. You see they are moving towards the, in the wrong direction, but a, a particle jumps into the right place. 
and then she attracts all the others and they eventually uh, <clears throat> find consensus uh, or they align over there. But you can also have these kind of things uh, on an, a more general manifolds like a torus. This is the Ackley function on a torus. And you have that the swarm moves on the torus. The, the red spot is the global minima on the torus. And they explore and then they concentrate all into the uh, <clears throat> global minima. Of course, these are uh, easy examples because the dimension is, uh, these are low dimensional examples, but of course, for visualization purposes, it's, uh, they clarify a little bit how things, how things work. Okay, so uh, where it all started. So it all started from, uh, uh, so this uh, idea of using uh, uh, mean field uh, approaches to, to try to study this problem. It all started with the introduction and um, uh, essentially uh, by uh, some people that is actually present here. We have the Claudia, it's here, Oliver, it's here. Uh, the, mm, of a different kind of metaheuristic, which already starts from a stochastic differential equation. So it has already somehow a good mathematical foundation, which is inspired by uh, essentially stochastic differential equation and, uh, and particle, and uh, uh, let's say the way we usually deal with, uh, with the particle dynamics. And the idea over there is that once you have the optimization problem uh, on the top, let me, as in terms of notation, I use X star to indicate the global minimum. Of course, we are assuming that uh, the function admits uh, uh, only one, uh, one, global, uh, one global minima. Uh, then uh, you have an evolution of N particles accordingly to a simple dynamic, which is composed by two processes, an alignment process towards some estimated global minima that uh, here it's uh, denoted by um, this uh, X bar alpha. And then we will discuss that uh, in, in a second. So this is an al alignment of the particle position towards this estimated global minima. And then you have some... Uh, diffusion which favors exploration and you see that this diffusion typically it's a function of the distance between the position of the particle and the estimated global minima the idea is that you are going to introduce more noise if you are very far from from the estimated global minima whereas when you are close to the global minima then the noise goes to zero so that particle can align, can find, uh, can find consensus. Otherwise, they will continue to move by uh, some kind of uh, uh, random, uh, uh, random motion. Uh, now, one of the key idea was to use the Laplace principle in order to have a smooth, uh, essentially, a representation of the global minima. Uh, namely, you take the uh, weighted average of uh, essentially the position of uh, the particle and uh, the weight is uh, uh, given by a Gibbs measure here. And uh, you see that whenever alpha is very large, then what happens in this summation is that uh, uh, it concentrates over the particle that is in the best position, namely in the position where the, the function f has its minimum value. So basically for very large values of alpha, this, this, this uh, quantity here is going to concentrate on the argmin between the position of all, of all particles. Of course, if alpha is equal to zero, this is just an average of the position. Okay, And um, this has been particularly interesting, especially because uh, you can use the tools uh, of, uh, let's say, the mean field approach in order to study the behavior of, uh, of uh, this system. And uh, from the PDE viewpoint, uh, uh, you can follow a rather classical uh, uh, path to derive uh, the uh, mean field uh, approximation, which is given in, in this case by a Fokker-Planck equation. Uh, and you see that uh, these estimated uh, global minima uh, now has a, a, the, the same structure, but it's just an integral, an integral representation. And here, the diffusion, this is just, this is the component is an anisotropic noise, which is the 
the version which has been subsequently introduced uh, by uh, Jose Antonio, Xi Jin, Li, and, uh, and uh, Tu, uh, which gives better performance in terms of convergence compared to essentially the original formulation that was based on uh, um, uh, isotropic noise. It was just measuring essentially the L2, the L2 distance of uh, the particle from the global minimum. The main difference is that in one case, in this case, you're able to prove convergence over the global minima without a strong dependence from the dimension D. So in fact, the, the main result is that under suitable assumption, then on the intensity of the alignment, the strength of the noise and the, the magnitude of alpha, uh, when alpha is very large, the, 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 the estimate of the global minima is essentially the arg min, then uh, you can prove that independently of the dimension, uh, uh, the approach which has been followed by uh, uh, Jose Antonio Shijin is that the variance goes to zero. Uh, so you're going to concentrate toward one point, and then you show that, in fact, if alpha is sufficiently large, then this point is really the global minimum of uh, the function. There have been a different approach to study this problem by Fornasier, Clock, and Reid, but I will come back to this la later, later on. So uh, this was very interesting. It, mm, we, I mean, it stimulated a lot of the, the, our community to work in this, uh, in this, uh, in this direction. And uh, uh, among the various things, uh, one natural, uh, there are, the, the natural question would be, is this a way to try to think about giving a, a statistical physics perspective on the general field of metaheuristic? So basically, uh, can we extend the ideas and the analysis that we have seen in consensus-based optimization to other popular metaheuristic algorithms, some of the, of the list that you have shown before? Uh, another in, in question is, uh, if we follow this approach, can we also uh, obtain um, some direction in order to design new and better uh, algorithms, which are mathematically explainable compared to the classical metaheuristic. Um, again, uh, since uh, this idea is to resort to PDEs, so to differential models, uh, maybe this is also the way to have a better understanding of the relationship between metaheuristic and gradient-based method. Uh, and finally, a fourth point, uh, of course, there may be other, th those are the four that I think uh, that came to my mind at the beginning, is if there are any connection between uh, this consensus-based optimization and uh, a much older and existing metaheuristic. So I will give you an overview of some of the research that we have done in this direction uh, concerning actually the three algorithms which we can say are somehow mm, probably the most uh, popular uh, and are those that, as I was saying, you, you can find directly even uh, in, uh, in different implementation in uh, various software packages or even, as I was saying, even in directly in MATLAB. So, um, of course, these algorithms, they have a different level of complexity because the the first one, which is the old one, is simulated annealing and is based on a generation of a single point. There's no swarm, there's no communication. It's just a single point that moves at each iteration. And uh, this uh, uh, point that you generate at each iteration is going to eventually approach uh, an optimal solution of the problem. Um, genetic algorithm, on the other hand, is, there, is, gonna, is based on a population of points, not on a single point. Uh, and then at each iteration, essentially, you generate a new population accordingly to some rule, and the fittest evolves toward an optimal solution. Uh, the third one, which is particle swarm optimization, is the one which in some sense is closer to our field because it really starts by generating a swarm of points uh, where you have a particle position and velocity, and you have a swarm that moves toward the optimal solution. I'm not following a chronological uh, path of the time we started to work on this because in fact we started uh, to get to find result uh, by particle swarm optimization first because it's the one that in some sense is closer to let's say 
uh, the idea of designing some uh, kinetic or mean field theory approach. So, but I'm following this, the complexity line, which uh, uh, is essentially uh, the one uh, which I think it is gonna permit in the end to understand a little bit better uh, what are the connection between these different approaches. Okay, so this is somehow the outline what I plan to say and uh, starting from simulated annealing, then genetic algorithm, and then uh, particle swarm optimization. Of course, I don't have enough time to enter the details, so I'll give you some overview, and then you may ask about more details, and you find more details in the, in the different references. Okay, so simulated annealing. Simulated annealing is probably one of the most fascinating algorithm, I think. Uh, it's the, the, the algorithm has been proposed in the 80s by Kirkpatrick, Gellant, and Vecchi, but in fact, the algorithm is really uh, the original Metropolis algorithm of the 50s, uh, which was somehow a way to generate uh, a, a sequence of samples from a given distribution. Uh, then uh, what they added, uh, of course, the contribution by Kirkpatrick, Gelat, and Vecchi is absolutely non-trivial because the idea of using the annealing, as you will see, is what really makes the difference between the fact that the algorithm becomes a way to optimize the function. But the, the, the situation is very simple. Uh, so you have a, a particle that moves essentially by, by, by Brownian motion. Uh, the uh, quantity here, sigma, essentially, uh, it's uh, uh, characterized the intensity of uh, of uh, your your Brownian motion, and on the top of that, you have an external parameter with that we can refer to as temperature, which is really a control parameter. So the temperature is a control parameter uh, that we will. At the beginning, you, you can just think to this as just as a constant. Uh, it doesn't really matter. We will jump only at point three of the algorithm we think about the fact that this temperature here uh, is not necessarily constant. So uh, then you have some uh, motion here, the sigma characterize the, the, the intensity or the standard deviation of the Brownian motion that you're putting. Uh, once you have the new point here, what you do is very simple. You take a look at what's the value of your fitness function in this new point. And, it, and if, of course, it's, if it's better than your starting point, then you accept the point. So if you're moving in the same, the, the same direction, you're always accepting. But of course, in this case, this will not work very well for non-convex function. So the idea is that if the new point is worse, then it is still accepted, but with the probability which depends essentially on the difference between the two values of the fitness function. So if the two values of the fitness function are not very distant, then the probability to accept it is pretty high because it doesn't change much. Whereas if the, the, you are really, uh, uh, the probability basically to, to make a uphill jump is not very high, it's very, it's very small, but there is always some probability. Now, uh, up to point number two, so we have a fixed temperature. The algorithm is really the Metropolis Asting algorithm. It is just a way to sample from the Boltzmann-Gibbs probability density. It means that if we just continue to do this point one and two, point one and two, and we move this point, then this point is gonna converge to a sample from this probability density. Now, uh, the idea of the algorithm then is to lower the temperature because if you lower the temperature, you see this temperature here as the, the, the role, which is the inverse of the value that you have in alpha in, uh, in consensus-based optimization. So low value of the temperature correspond to large values of alpha. Then this is gonna concentrate and it's gonna concentrate on the values where essentially the function, the fitness function has its minimum. Uh, so, then the idea is to lower the temperature, but this is, as we will see, this has to be done carefully. And there are several results in the literature. One way is to decrease the temperature with time accordingly to one over the logarithm of the number of the number of, of iteration. And this is the classical choice for simulating annealing. The idea basically is then that you have this sampling part, which is gonna produce a sample from this probability density, plus 
this uh, reduction of the temperature, which is such that is going to concentrate the position of the sample in the global minimum of the function f. Now, uh, this uh, as close connection with what is referred to as uh, uh, Langevin dynamic, in the sense that uh, this stochastic differential process, which is usually is referred to as the Langevin dynamic, uh, it, it has this particular feature that uh, it's a way also to generate a point with this probability density. And this can be immediately seen. Just take the mean field uh, formal analysis, mean field of this equation, you get this Fokker Planck, and the steady state of this Fokker Planck is clearly this distribution. So, okay, it's immediate. Now, uh, <clears throat> another interesting aspect, however, is that uh, this process here can be understood as the limit for small learning rates of a stochastic gradient descent method. You see here we are computing the gradient of our function of our function f, whereas before we were not computing any gradient. But these two dynamics they share the same long time behavior. That's one of the reasons why you can find in many papers they refer to this equation as continuous simulating annealing or diffusive simulating annealing and so on. Now. The, the idea of the annealing, to be more precise here, is the following. You still have that by the Laplace principle, when the temperature goes to zero, you have that uh, the concentration over the minimum occurs. You see here in this uh, uh, just a plot of the um, Boltzmann-Gibbs measure in the case of the Ackley function that we have seen before, and you see some various values of the temperature, starting from a temperature of three up to a temperature of one. Of course, I'm not taking smaller temperature because otherwise you will have a concentration is too strong, so you don't appreciate the differences. And you see how it works, basically, that the, the, you have the steady state, which concentrates more and more towards the value zero, where you have the global, the global minimum. Um, so, so far, so good. Now, the big issue, however, is that the time to reach equilibrium increases exponentially with 1 over t, which means that if we think that this is a nice algorithm and uh, what we have to do is simply to take smaller values of the temperature, then it doesn't work. Because if the temperature is small, then it never converges. Okay? But it really never converges. You can do some numerical experiment and you will see that the time is really exponential. If the function especially is difficult, to minimize, instead of using the Ackley function, you use the rust region one-dimensional function, it's going to take forever. Already for a temperature t, t equal one half. Okay? Forever, I mean really forever. Um, so the idea is the following. Well, we need to, we want to have small values of the temperature because we want the method to concentrate. But at the same time, we, we, we want that the solution converts toward the steady state uh, rather fast. So the idea is then what you have to do is that you have to start with a temperature, which is not small, so that the dynamic is going to drive the system toward the equilibrium state. And then you have to slowly decrease the temperature in such a way that the dynamic doesn't jump away from the equilibrium state. And at the same time, it starts to concentrate. This, of course, is very delicate. And there are many results uh, for, for simulated annealing. You have many papers which study this kind of dynamic. And what you can see is that if the, the temperature decays like one over the logarithm, essentially, you can prove that it converts weakly to the set of global minima. So what's not fully satisfactory with this picture, there is the first thing is that, uh, OK, this is nice. But it requires the gradient evaluation, uh, which, uh, as in contrast with the gradient-free nature of the simulating annealing algorithm, and closely connected to this, or another way to say the same thing, is that this diffusive process, how is related uh, to the original simulating annealing algorithm? And apparently, there, have been, there are no derivation in the literature on, uh, on that. So um, one way to tackle this is by uh, describing the simulated annealing process in terms of probability. Uh, this is really essentially the Kolmogorov forward uh, evolution of the probability density uh, with the, the invariant measure of this dynamic is the Gibbs, uh, the Gibbs measure. And uh, it, you can directly write uh, in a rather standard way the evolution for the probability density as, a, as a two things, uh, the, the usual gain 
and loss part, uh, which uh, depends uh, on uh, uh, essentially the um, this kernel BF, which produces the selection. So if we accept the move, essentially, or not. Let me just say that here I'm using a notation, which you may find particular, but that's uh, quite standard. Uh, I use wedges to denote the expectation with respect to the selection probability. Okay, so the selection probability is the, the one that appears here, and these wedges that you see here and here is just the expectation. So there's an additional integral with respect to uh, P of C, dex C here, uh, just to have a compact uh, notation. Uh, you see that this B of F is the probability to accept. It's the same as before. In fact, before it was one if the new position is better and the ratio of the Gibbs measure if the, probability, the new position is worse. You can uh, write everything in compact form like the minimum between one and the ratio of uh, the Gibbs measure in the new position uh, over the Gibbs measure in the previous, in the previous position. Um, well, just by direct substitution, you see that the Gibbs distribution is, is an invariant measure for the equation. And uh, you can write the, the weak form for a symmetric selection probability. I will reduce my analysis to symmetric selection probability. And uh, uh, for those which are familiar with the Boltzmann equation, you can rewrite everything as a classical linear Boltzmann equation where you have the appearance of the equilibrium states here. Uh, which is, uh, let's say, the Maxwellian equilibrium state of the system. And uh, so it's uh, with now the, the, the kernel, which in this new formulation is symmetric because it's different. Basically, uh, you have to, to take out the, the value of the equilibrium state in the new estimated position, the, the post-interacting position X prime. So it's really a classical linear Boltzmann equation. Uh, and so for this kind of equation, you can use uh, somehow a, the toolbox of uh, kinetic theory for what concern entropies. And you can show basically that you have a families of convex function, which are entropies, which decays along the solution. You can even evaluate the, 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 entropy, the entropy production. In particular, if the function phi that you take here is x log x minus x plus one, then you have the classical uh, Shannon-Boltzmann entropy, the logarithmic entropy. For which, essentially, if you have a, logar a modified logarithmic Sobolev inequality of this type, you have the exponential decay of uh, the, uh, uh, the entropy to zero, which, thanks to the pizar kullback inequality, is going to imply the L1 convergence of the solution towards the equilibrium. Um, of course, all these in the case of a constant temperature, okay? So there's a, what happens if the temperature is time dependent? If the temperature is time dependent, you have to be careful because yet when you compute the derivative here, uh, basically you have to consider the fact that your temperature two t now is in an independent variable. So you have also to compute the the, uh, the derivative of uh, the temperature. So one, now if we measure the variation of the entropy, we get the usual entropy dissipation as before plus this blue term which is the, the term which tells you that you have in front of this, you have the ratio between the derivative of the temperature and the square of the temperature. So, and you want this, that as the temperature, go, I mean, essentially as the temperature goes to zero, you want to control this term. So for example, uh, and we want to, the, the, the temperature to decay. If you, if you take a decay, which is too strong, like one over T, what happens is that this term here is equal to one essentially, it's an order one quantity. So you don't, you are not able to control this. This remains and is gonna, uh, um, uh, essentially, uh, is gonna um, make the convergence uh, uh, to uh, equilibrium essentially not possible. Uh, whereas if you take the logarithm, then this ratio here is exactly equal to one over T, and then you can bound the quantity so you can get an estimate for the entropy where you have the usual entropy dissipation part as before plus this term here, where you just take out the, the, the L infinity norm of your function f and L1 norm of the distance from, uh, from equilibrium. And you see now that as time goes to infinity, this quantity here essentially goes to uh, zero. And so if the time is large enough, uh, we still have the decay of the entropy. And then it means that on, we have that convergence toward equilibrium. Um, now, since uh, 
uh, we have convergence toward the equilibrium of the solution. At the same time, we have that the temperature goes to zero. And so we have that uh, the function, uh, not only the global minima, so sorry, the steady state concentrate on the global minima, but also the solution concentrate on, uh, on uh, the global minima. Again, by application of the uh, caesar kullback inequality to this thing here. Okay, so, so far so good. So we have convergence. It's a, I, I, I mean, this is quite interesting in the sense it's an explicit computation that tells you uh, rather it's an easy computation which tells you that actually one over the logarithm works. That's exactly how you get it at the discrete level. So uh, now, since we have a kinetic equation, we may think about analyzing the mean field limit of the kinetic equation, which is the same limit which uh, drives you from the Boltzmann equation to the Landau equation is a way, is a different way to pass to a mean field dynamic starting from a, a one particle or, a, or a, a dynamic in, the, in our equation. Uh, to do this, by analogy with what is usually done, we rescale the time, and in this case, and we rescale the noise according to a small parameter epsilon. Of course, if you rescale the noise in this way, you know that as epsilon goes to zero, nothing happens, so the point doesn't move anymore, which means that x prime is equal to x, and so you can do a Taylor expansion, essentially, in the weak formulation of this equation of your test function phi, and uh, provided that uh, our uh, function f uh, that we want to minimize uh, as some uh, uh, regularity, we can also do a Taylor expansion of uh, the Boltzmann-Gibbs uh, measure, which uh, is a way to make the gradient of f appear. If we do this two Taylor expansion, we plug it to here, we do the computation, and uh, we restrict to the first order approximation, then one can show that when you pass to the limit epsilon to zero, you um, by relating the variance uh, of uh, the, the, the Brownian motion to the control temperature exactly in this way, then you get exactly the Langevin dynamic, which means that under the scaling, the simulated annealing converge exactly to the stochastic gradient descent for small learning rate, if you want, or to the Langevin dynamic. And uh, well, let me say that you can do this also by other approaches, but I want to show you here just a couple of numerical results. Uh, so now this is a fixed temperature t equal to, uh, we have the Ackley function as before. Uh, you can just, uh, if you want, you can just focus on the, this red curve and the, the, which is the most important, which is the, the kinetic simulating annealing I was describing uh, now. Uh, on the left, uh, you have that epsilon, the scaling parameter is uh, 10 to the minus two. So the, the, basically the method is not necessarily converging towards the stochastic gradient descent. The reference solution is the, the, the exit Boltzmann-Gibbs measure, which is the steady state of the, uh, uh, um, our mean field Langevin dynamic. And this purple one is uh, essentially the stochastic gradient descent with a learning rate, which has not passed to the limit. Or if you want, is the euler maruyama discretization of the um, stochastic differential equation which describe the Langevin dynamic. And you see here in any case that when the scaling is not too small, you get different asymptotic results. Here you see the entropy. They are mostly somehow decaying the entropy um, and uh, in particular the proof we have was for this kinetic simulating annealing that you see that is perfectly decaying. But what's interesting here is that if you take epsilon way smaller, like 10 to the minus four, you, see, you observe exactly the convergence of your simulating annealing towards the, the, the steady state, which is our reference, our reference solution. And you all essentially approaches that we have seen here, they are gonna give you the same. Now, if on the other hand, now we take an annealing structure, so we let the temperature goes to zero like one over the logarithm, starting again from a temperature equal to two. Now it, it takes more time because here, if you see the entropy decays in, on a time scale of two here, we have a time scale of 20. Uh, so the time is a little bit longer, but you can observe a concentration. And of course, depending on, on the scaling, you have that you can exactly match the, the essentially the, the stochastic gradient descent dynamic and the simulated, the, the simulated annealing dynamic as well as all, all entropies. 
Okay, so this was, uh, uh, so there are some uh, um, interesting things that we have seen concerning simulated annealing. Now, uh, let's consider uh, how we can apply uh, similar technology to the case of uh, genetic algorithm. Of course, um, the, if we consider genetic algorithm, then the situation is less clear. First, uh, whereas simulated annealing has been derived by, derived by classical uh, uh, classical physical inspiration. So uh, the description of the algorithm is uh, uh, completely, is uniquely defined in some sense. With the genetic algorithm, this is more a kind of a philosophy in some sense, which has been inspired by the uh, original paper by Turing in the 50s, where there was this idea of saying we can compute some evolution of a sequence on point in such a way that by an evolutionary strategy, they optimize something. Um, so, uh, it's, which means that uh, accordingly to the, the implementation, the algorithms can be extremely different. Uh, so let me, in any case, identify what are the fixed points now in genetic algorithm in the way that Holland presented in the 90s. So basically, now we have a population of points. So we don't have a single point, it's a population, which means that there is interaction. Uh, and the idea is that they evolve in order to find better solution. The, the way they evolve is rather simple in some sense, uh, because uh, you select a group of individuals that typically they have a better fitness, okay, which means that they are in better position with respect to the function you want to minimize. Uh, they usually call these parents. And uh, these, uh, the idea is that they contribute uh, with their genes, as they say, uh, which are nothing else than the, entity, the entries of the vectors of the positions of the, of the parents to their children. And actually, what is interesting is that the algorithm really works by pairs. So you take a pair of parents and then you generate children accordingly to two main evolutionary dynamic, which is crossover. So you combine the vector of a pair of parents in different way and mutation, we, you introduce random changes or mutation to a single parent. Uh, then uh, you can eventually perform an additional selection uh, by, again, uh, based on a fitness-based fitness mechanism, which means that you basically you apply some filtering accordingly to the position where the, 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 the points are at the end of the game. Now, this is really an evolution through binary interaction. Uh, and uh, so given a pair of parents, uh, uh, which have been selected accordingly to, to some function here, some selection function, the process which leads to a, an offspring is essentially a mixture of a crossover, where this is the Adamard component-wise Adamard product, that, uh, uh, and a mutation, which can occur component, component by component. Um, Typically, the mutation vector is assumed time dependent because uh, exactly as in consensus-based optimization, uh, this mutation vector is such that as time goes to infinity, it will essentially reduce its intensity so that uh, the, the, uh, the population can concentrate toward the, the essentially the minimum of the, the essentially uh, that we want to get. Uh, now, if you start with that description, uh, formally, we, you can uh, uh, write down a Boltzmann equation in the case of a large number of interacting particles, where essentially, of course, you're doing some assumption here. Uh, the main assumption is the fact that the total number of agents is unchanged. So basically, we replace the children, we replace the parents with the children, okay? But let me say that this is not such a strong assumption because basically in all algorithms, they do something of this type because otherwise the number of individuals is gonna explode. So, uh, and it's not a big, uh, a big deal, honestly, to put some uh, potential, let's say, variation of the mass density, but which remains, which remains uh, bounded. But in most algorithms, they also uh, consider exactly this, this setting. Um, uh, now, the big, mathematically speaking, the presence of this kernel here can make things a little bit more uh, difficult. So I'm gonna just show you a few slides in the case where we consider a slightly simplified dynamic, uh, but this has been extended more recently to the general case in a work together with uh, uh, Giacomo Borghi. Um, the idea is the following. In, uh, in kinetic theory, is uh, uh, 
you have two ways to perform essentially uh, a, a selection uh, uh, in of points during a dynamic. One way is to have a kernel of this type, which acts as a filter in the choice of the particle that will interact. So basically, if the particle has certain characteristics, then they're going to interact, otherwise they don't interact. But you can write down a simplified model where all particles interact, and you modulate the strength so the intensity of the interaction accordingly to the same function that you have here, okay? Typically, these two processes, if you do the mean field scaling that we have seen before, they're gonna convert to the same mean field limit. But of course, at the kinetic level, at the Boltzmann level, they are completely different. So if we do this, then let me just say that it is possible to write down, a, 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 let's say, a genetic type algorithm where the selection probability is given by, again, by the Boltzmann-Gibbs measure. Uh, it's one of the many choices that they use, but of course the Boltzmann-Gibbs measure for us was particularly interesting because it's the same which has been used in CBO as well as in simulated annealing. So if you do this, now I'm not gonna enter in the detail because as usual with the Boltzmann equation, it's, uh, it's uh, rather, rather complicated. Let me just say that you can write down uh, the, the binary interaction uh, and then you can, what you do is that you, you look at the evolution of the expected position of the mean and uh, the variance. And uh, uh, under some assumption, uh, boundedness assumption over the function that you want to optimize, uh, you can prove that, that the variance essentially decays to zero, uh, provided in this case you need to have some, uh, that the noise uh, has to satisfy um, a bound uh, with respect to the, 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 intensity, the intensity of the uh, alignment. So uh, this is more or less full of the same path of the proof uh, introduced by uh, Jose Antonio, uh, and uh, basically, so you can show that the variance uh, goes to zero, which means that the solution concentrates over a Dirac delta. Then the point is that this Dirac delta, which is concentrated in X tilde, then the next step, you need to show that this X tilde is the global minimum of the function. But to do this, then you need to, to make some uh, uh, regularity assumption over your function f. Uh, these are technical assumptions. I mean, the method, of course, works. Uh, it's a meta, it's an heuristic, so it works even for this continuous solution. But if you want to prove something, that you need to make some smoothness assumption on on the function. And if essentially the the value of uh, here it's called the beta, which was the the one that before was called uh, uh, alpha, and which is the anyway is the uh, um, uh, proportional to the inverse of the temperature. If this is large enough, then you can show that uh, provided that uh, the local minimum was initially in the support of your initial data, then it's going to concentrate on that. Uh, just a remark: there is a different approach to uh, this this kind of uh, uh, problem, which has been introduced by Massimo for Nazier and collaborators, and that, that has been used also later for this same problem uh, uh, together with Giacomo, is that instead of uh, considering the variance, you consider directly uh, the, 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 this energy functional, which is related to the variance, but instead of measuring essentially uh, with, uh, the, the, the distance with respect to the mean, you measure it directly the distance with respect to the global minima. If you do this, the situation is somehow simpler because this uh, you can use the tools from the uh, uh, essentially the, the Wasserstein uh, matrix. And once you're able to prove that this goes to zero, then simultaneously you have both consensus formation and convergence towards the, 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 the Dirac uh, delta concentrated in uh, the global minimum. Numerically, in general, what you can really show is that if you compute numerically these, then this typically is a functional which decays always in time. Whereas if you look at the variance, this is in general not the case. The variance decays only if initially we are close enough to the global minimum. Imagine we have the global minima here, no? We start with the data here. Then the particle, they have to move. They need to go there. Then the variance has to increase initially. Then they reach the point and then they concentrate, okay? So the, it's hopeless unless the, the, the um, uh, uh, global minima is already contained in the support of the function initially that we have some decay of the variance. Okay, um, now just one uh, remark. 
Are there any relation between genetic algorithms and consensus-based optimization? Yes, it's possible to derive consensus-based optimization in the, as the mean field limit of a genetic, almost genetic algorithm, to be honest, because is, you see there's no more real any binary dynamic here because it's really an interaction between the point and the estimated average among all other points. Okay. Good. So I'm skipping to the last part, which is this uh, the case of uh, particle swarm optimization. So particle swarm optimization, it's, uh, um, well, this is somehow uh, probably uh, uh, among the algorithm, the, the most uh, famous because of the uh, in, of its close connection with the notion of swarm intelligence, so the idea that you have a swarm that evolves in order to de, to to do to do some uh, specific activity, and uh, actually you see that you have a, this is a kind of a second order model, and uh, uh, you see that you have two main processes in particle swarm optimization, which are two social processes. Okay, okay, because the the processes you see they are driven by the constant C1 and C2. Here I've done already some sort of splitting of the process in such a way to emphasize the analogy to with what I've discussed up to now. But really, you have uh, the alignment is made by two different dynamics. One is an individual alignment. You align uh, according to your way, personal way of thinking. So you have some memory of the best position and you have the tendency to align toward the best place that you have visited. And then there is a second alignment, which is... Uh, Basically, you can communicate with all the other and you have the tendency to go to the best place. Okay, it's a little bit the fight between you have to go to a restaurant and you want to follow the suggestion of your friends or you want to go where you like. This is the idea. In fact, uh, the, um, I mean, it's uh, uh, one, uh, the, the, the two uh, people that wrote this paper, one is a sociologist and the other is an engineer. So they have completely different uh, uh, viewpoint. But, and then there is a noise. But you see that the way C1 and C2 in particle swarm optimization, they really split between individual and collective. There's no any separation between real alignment and exploration. So there's no way in the particle swarm optimization that I can increase the noise without changing also the strength of the alignment. They are connected. Uh, well, <clears throat> the difficult part here of the story is the memory because this particle have memory so if you want to try to write down some uh, continuous formulation of this, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not immediate. Uh, but finally, we manage it by taking inspiration uh, from the consensus-based optimization work. And uh, we've wrote everything as a generalized time discrete formalism, as you can see here. And uh, if we add one additional differential equation which essentially at the discrete level is exactly a, a memory type of equation. But when you pass, of course, to the continuous approximation, it becomes some approximation of a memory of a memory effect. Uh, then you pass to the limit, then you get a stochastic differential formulation of particle swarm optimization, which uh, uh, and uh, the, you have the additional memory effect here. And uh, the other difference is that in general you will have again, that uh, alignment and diffusion are in principle connected. Of course, what we did, we did a further step. We separate alignment and diffusion in such a way that you, we can control exactly as in CBO, the dynamic of the, uh, of the system. Uh, you do the mean field in this case, uh, you get a vlasov fokker planck equation for this uh, problem. Um, and uh, for... <clears throat> Again, by uh, the analysis is slightly different, but uh, let me say that you can, uh, especially in the absence of memory, the, the analysis is not, uh, uh, is a generalization of what we have seen before, but is reasonably doable when you put the presence of the memory is a little bit more uh, technical, but there are papers, especially by Wang, Q, Riddle, uh, that uh, have been able to manage convergence to the global minimum, even, in uh, presence of uh, of memory of memory effect, uh, just to say one word that again you can derive CBO, but in this case it, this corresponds to the small inertial limit of our um, Vlasov-Fokker-Planck system. 
And uh, of course, we get some generalized uh, CBO model because you keep the memory effects in, uh, in the end. Uh, the last thing I want to show you, because I'm late, uh, you see it's this table of numbers which doesn't look so nice, but it gives you one important aspect. What the two columns you have here on the right is the MATLAB implementation of particles form optimization that we try to optimize in such a way to get the better result. This is a sequence of test function, and these are the results that we get. Uh, the one you have here is the CBO, classical CBO method, so which means that we are uh, taking the low inertia limit of particles form optimization, if you want. And this is really the low inertia limit of particles form optimization because we have memory. Uh, and you see there's a dramatic difference. As soon as the function becomes difficult, uh, the, the performance you can get, uh, this is in dimension, uh, I think it's dimension 50. If, so it's a high dimensional problem. Uh, and this is the, just look at the percentage of uh, success that, uh, that you have. Uh, if uh, the function is uh, uh, quite uh, difficult, like uh, the rust region, okay, you can have a rate of the 90% with the CBO with memory. Uh, there's no way you are even able to get one single run with jump into the global minimum. So the kind of algorithm you get are way better than the state of the art of the algorithm. And I'm pretty convinced about that. We didn't push too much this thing, but now we are collaborating with some engineers, even in Ferrara, and they're also realizing that this way of doing things is way better than the, the, the algorithm they have implemented before. Okay, so here are some remarks. Uh, of course, the, the, I think the, the, the approach, I found it very interesting, both mathematically, but also in terms of uh, potentially design new and more efficient algorithm. Of course, mathematically is very interesting because you jump into completely different model. They are inspired by nature. Actually, we, we have done a lot of work in describing physics by kinetic theory and by, with the tools of statistical physics. This is simply artificial physics, and you follow the same path. You just write down the PDE, which correspond to this artificial physics. Of course, uh, uh, this is not, not answering many problems because we are discussing the limit as n to infinity. So we don't we are not really saying anything about the behavior for a finite number of particles. But this seems to be rather hopeless in the sense that you can get this kind of result, but with very strong assumption on the, on the function that you want to uh, 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 minimize, which means that at the end of the day, they never give you any practical estimate, at least to my knowledge. Um, and uh, of course, there are other problems. You have the hyperparameters, which means the, the, the discretization parameter of your uh, mean field dynamic, which have an influence on the, on the uh, behavior. Uh, estimating the rates of convergence, as well as many other theoretical problems, they are really dependent on the kind of metaheuristic that you're trying to do. And uh, the big challenge is also that uh, uh, everything works as soon as you have been able to translate everything into a differential form. And this is not non-trivial at all. The last remark is that uh, this idea has some side effect in other fields, like more in general in social sciences, because you know, you now in some sense, you have a strategy to derive uh, microscopic interaction rules in social economic sciences, which are based on the notion of utility function. Because once you get your utility function, you can write down essentially some algorithm, which is gonna jump into the minimum of the utility function. And this will be a microscopic way to construct a model which is consistent with the usual assumption, which are often done, especially in the macroeconomy. Uh, so uh, to, to build up a bridge between what is usually the, the modeling structure of economists and the, our, our approach. And uh, let me thank, of course, all collaborators uh, in, uh, in this journey uh, that uh, have done most of the of most of the work. Thank you. Thank you. Before in the talk of Dante, he was interested in control. Is there no time dependent signal in sense? Is there any idea on if this can be used or extended or I don't slides to also solve um, our problems where the underlying space might not be just uh, Yeah, well, uh, there are mm, in principle uh, the ideas they can be translated also into that direction, but there are several difficulties because you have to find a way somehow to measure 
uh, consistent way to measure the distances in such a way that uh, you have some alignment and to define even the notion of diffusion. So you have many more degrees of freedom. So uh, there are probably too many ways potentially to do that. And you have to try to find a good way which gives you uh, a good result. It may not be, be so, so easy, but it's one of the things we are started to work uh, recently. More questions? Yep. There's one. So in the simulator annealing part, uh, th there was a gradient of f, the cost function. Okay. Yeah. So, do you need some constraint on uh, the form of f? So it, it should be differentiable, right? So yeah, does course. it apply with, for any cost function, or we have a priori some uh, condition on uh, the cost function? No, no, there is no condition. The only the the the, the the cost function, you have some boundedness condition, of course, because you have to, to be able to compute either the minimum or the the, uh, the maximum. In that case, it has to be differentiable because otherwise you don't uh, you don't have the the, uh, the the expansion. And then it has to be probably a little bit more than simply differentiable because you have a uh, you have a Taylor expansion, and we need to be able within the integral, to bound the, the reminder, okay? The, the derivation that I've done has been formal just by imagining that we can bound the reminder. But if you want to work technically on that, then you certainly uh, need to have a, a little bit more of regularity. So like a boundedness of the second order derivative properly. Okay, more questions? One question. Uh, and if the function f, it's very complicated to to compute. It, it's a given by a Navier-Stokes code. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know which uh, method will use the less in, uh, times to to, to 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 compute this function? Yeah, is there any? Yeah, the, 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 what 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 uh, what I can say that that's one of the reasons why quite often they they prefer to use a method which is based on a on a single point. Okay, because uh, these approaches are very robust, which means that whatever you do, they give you some answers. And of course, uh, the worst case scenario is that your single point, instead of being able to, to jump into the global minima, is going to jump into a local minima. Okay, then it's up to you practically, it's a sort of trade off. If uh, I'm paying a very low price, but most likely I'm going to jump in a local minima, which is not optimal, but maybe reasonable for my application. Or I'm gonna pay a higher price because I really need to go into the into the global minima. And in the second case, then it's better to to use a, a collection of samples because if they can communicate, then the convergence is definitely faster. So if you really want to go to the global minima, definitely the method like genetic algorithm or particles form optimization or consensus based optimization, they do a better job than simulating and needing. But if you say, well. I don't care too much because, I mean, for example, with the rest region function, I was saying it's very difficult, okay? But on the other hand, if I'm more thinking as an engineer, I would say, well, it's the simplest one. Why? Because all local minima are the same. So I don't care. Just jump into one. That's enough for me. I don't want, want really to have. So it's really when you go to the applied side, it's slightly different. That's one of the reasons why they often they use just a method which are based on a, like stochastic gradient descent. So on the single on the single point, just because it's cheaper actually. Okay, more questions. Then maybe one comment you um, you already said that uh, some of the heuristics are implemented in MATLAB. So um, if you want to play around with uh, CBO or variants of it, um, there is a GitHub repository with Python code, and there will be Julia soon. So if you're interested or want, then also CBO is uh, available. Yeah, great. That's a very good thing. <laughs> and um, yeah, other than that, thank you again. And thank all the speakers of today.